Sir, good morning to all of you. Uh, very good morning to uh, uh, Professor Anand sir, Professor Shangan ma'am. Very good morning to good morning Dr. Sir, Dishi sir. Sir, actually uh, Professor Aswal, uh, Professor Dikhi Aswal from uh, Bhavana Atomic Research Center, he is just trying to join, but he could not join yet. So what we think that we should start, and after half an hour or so, or uh, during the next session, we will request him, or after half an hour, we will request him to speak. And then we will continue our own session. Sure. Will it be okay, sir? Absolutely, no problem. Please, sir. So kindly, you, sir, you please start. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Professor C. V. Anand, yesterday, sir, you continue. Please, sir, please continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sorry for being late. Sorry. No problem. No problem. These things happen. <laughs> Don't think to worry. Please, sir. Please. Now, friends, I'm going to start the please, sir. Of the standard. Yesterday, we stopped at 4.13, I think. That is control of yes, sir. Today, yes, we. Sir. Today we'll move on. We'll move on with 4.14. I'll share my screen. Please, sir. You have to make me host, I think. You have to make me host, I think. Have you made me the host? Okay. Have we all been given that exercise one? So, Astoji, there is no need of any uh, lecture or something from sir, actually, actually, sir. Yes, sir. So, we are just going to start the session from Professor C. V. Anand, sir. And yesterday we have uh, completed the clause up to 4.13. Now we are continuing from 4.17. Ah. Okay. Sorry, 4.14. I'm sorry, sorry, sir. 4.14. Plus one point four point one four. Ah, okay. Please continue. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Pro Professor Aswal will join. Yes, sir. He will join, sir. He's trying. Actually, due to some technical problem, he could not join yet. As soon as he will join, we will take him after half an hour or so during the next before the next uh, the next class will start. We will request him to speak so that we will make him free as soon as possible. Okay, so. So today the panelist discussions are there. Too. No, so yes, sir. The clauses, the clause discussion, the discussion of this standard clause wise continue. Class wise. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. 
thank you thank you sir thank you very much sir thank you thank you thank you please sir now we move on with the can you hear me can you hear me yes sir we can hear you please thank you uh we move on and uh, we start uh, 2.14 today Fourteen is evaluation and audits. Four point fourteen. Ah, yeah. Evaluation. Papa, the lecture on which app is running? Sir, no. I have to disconnect. Four point fourteen is evaluation and audit. Four point fourteen point one is general. By now, you would have noticed that if the last decimal is point one. invariably it is general it's a general requirement okay now one more thing we forgot to tell you yesterday is that when we say shall when the standard says shall it it's a requirement it's a requirement and if the standard says should it is a recommendation these two differences you must know. shall means you know it's it becomes mandatory hence it it becomes a requirement so wherever the word shall is there please see that it's a requirement another thing is this word shall is used by convention only by the standard only by the standard the laboratory will not use shall in any of the documents because it's only the standard that will use the word shall okay please remember this the laboratory shall plan and implement the evaluation and internal audit processes needed to demonstrate that the pre examination examination post examination and supporting processes are being conducted in a manner that meets the needs and requirements of users now some time ago we were using the terms pre analytical analytical and post analytical we don't use those terms anymore because the standard has changed the terminology from pre analytical to pre examination analytical to examination and post analytical to post examination that is because everything is not analysis in the laboratory you know sometime ago you know we were taking two reagents and putting the serum or the blood and then boiling and then looking at the color and take a reading in a colorimeter or a spectrophotometer so it was all considered as analysis but right now i don't know whether how many of you have noticed that many of these things are exam you 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 look at the urine it's an examination you dip the strip in the urine and examine it you look under the microscope it's an examination hence the whole terminology has been changed from pre analytical to pre examination analytical to examination post analytical to post examination and as far as possible we'll try to use the same terminology because that's what the standard has started using now so what is the meaning of this laboratory shall plan and implement the evaluation and internal audit processes needed to demonstrate that the pre examination examination and post examination and supporting processes are being conducted in a manner that meets the needs and requirements of users we have already defined what are the needs and requirements of the users hence we have to see that when we conduct internal audit whether are we meeting the needs and requirements of the users ensure conformity to the quality management system yesterday we have seen the definition of quality management system we have established a quality management system we have implemented a quality management system we have also seen whether there is any improvement in quality management system so this internal audit is conducted by somebody who belongs to the laboratory please note that this internal audit is conducted by somebody who belongs to the laboratory and that person will see that whether the laboratory is following their own pre examination examination post examination and supporting processes that is number 1 number 2 they will also see whether the laboratory is conforming to its own quality management system you know yesterday we defined the we defined what is this quality management system and whether the laboratory is conforming to its own quality management that is what we the internal audit will see third point is continually improve the effectiveness of the quality management system please note that continual improvement is the primary goal of a quality management system primary goal where was the laboratory in may 2021 where is the laboratory today in may 2022 what improvement they have done so continually improve the effectiveness of the quality management system the results of evaluation and improvement activities shall be included in the input of the management review that is the next clause now there is a note here yesterday i already told you note will not be a part of any document in the laboratory 
note will not be a part of any document in the laboratory. It's only explanatory. People like us should use it to understand the meaning of this. Look at this note for improvement activity C 4.10, 4.11, 4.12. 4.9 is identification and control of non conformities. Yesterday that we have seen that. What is this 4.10 corrective action? 4.11 is preventive action. 4.12 is continual improvement. Hence, if the laboratory has successfully taken corrective action and also preventive action and also continual improvement, that has to have final improvement. The laboratory has to improve that. So that's what is the meaning of this particular note for improvement activity C 4.10, 4.11, 4.12. So basically 4.10 and 4.11, if the laboratory has done successfully, it has to result in 4.12, that is continual improvement. 4.14.2 is periodic review of requests and suitability of procedures and sample requirements. Now here, you know, uh, let us say last year we were using 3.5 ml of blood. This year we may feel that, you know, we don't require so much of blood. Uh, we may require only 2 ml of blood. We may, you know, if you take, uh, uh, if the laboratory is doing PT and APTT, today the laboratory may collect 2.7 ml of blood. After some time, a collection tube may change. Instead of 2.7 of blood, we may require only 1.8, provided the ratio between the anticoagulant and blood remains the same. So what happens here is, this is what the laboratory has to do, whether any improvement can be done. In, you know, if, instead of collecting so much of blood, whether the laboratory can reduce the volume of blood. That is what they have to do. So this is the meaning of this periodic review of requests and suitability of procedures and sample requirements. Authorized personnel shall periodically review the examinations provided by the laboratory to ensure that they are clinically appropriate for the requests received. The laboratory shall periodically review its sample volume. Look at that collection device. Now, for example, from EDTA, they may switch to green, that is uh, uh, lithium heparin. So, any, any change they want to bring about, that is what they have to discuss here. So, collection device and preservative requirements for blood, urine, and other body fluids, tissue, and other sample types as applicable to ensure that neither insufficient nor excessive amount of sample are collected and the sample is properly collected to preserve the measure. Now, what is the meaning of this? Suppose we are collecting 3 ml of blood. Now, is a, the, the serum that we get may be about 2.2 ml or something like that. So, in case, in case the laboratory wants to share this 2 ml serum with other sections, we can do that instead of, collect, in, instead of each section collecting separately. That's what this means. So, neither insufficient nor excess amount of sample should be collected. 4.14.3 is assessment of user feedback. What is this users? Users are doctors. So what we need to do is we have to design a, a feedback form that should include whether you know we are meeting the requirements of the users, whether our reports are correlating with their clinical findings, whether we are meeting their turnaround times, whether we are we are we are, you know, releasing the reports before the turnaround time, all these things. So this user feedback is very important for us because that's the only way for us to find out whether we are meeting the requirements of the users. Hence, the laboratory has to design a feedback form and distribute it to all the doctors and get their feedback and evaluate them. For example, how many of the doctors who use the services said that our laboratory is excellent? How many of them said we are good? How many of them said we are okay? That is average. How many of them said we are poor? That means we need to evaluate this. That is the, that is the meaning of this assessment of user feedback. So the laboratory has to design a user feedback, distribute it to all the users, and then get their feedback. Now, feedback is sought. You know, look at that, seek information. That means you have to ask them to give it to you. Whereas a complaint is not sought. Complaints come on their own. Complaints come on their own. You don't have to go and tell, come on, come on, complain against me. No, that's not that's not how it is. So here there's a difference between a feedback and a complaint. Complaint, complaints come on their own. Whereas here, according to the standard 4.14.3, we have to seek information relating to user perception as to whether the service has met the needs and requirements of users. The methods for obtaining and using this information shall include cooperation with users or their representatives in monitoring the laboratory's performance, provided that the laboratory ensures confidentiality to other users. That means, you know, we should not go on advertising saying that so-and-so gave me this kind of a rating and things like that. It should be totally confidential. 
Records have be kept of information collected and actions taken. Records, as we've already told you, records is the only evidence of any activity. Hence, records have to be maintained for this. 4.14.4 is staff suggestions. The laboratory management shall encourage staff to make suggestions for the improvement of any aspect of the laboratory service. For example, if there is a crowd in the outpatient department, all the patients are waiting there, standing. Most of them are standing. There's no place for them to sit down. Hence, one staff suggested, sir, we have to provide chairs for the people to sit down. Okay, that's one thing. Then uh, also, you know, there are a lot of lady patients and gents patients, and there is a, there is a mix up of that. It's all public. Everybody is looking. So one girl suggested, sir, we'll have a separate room for ladies patients, and we'll have a separate room for gents patients. So these are all the you know improvement activities which the laboratory staff can suggest. That is the meaning of this. The laboratory management shall encourage staff to make suggestions for the improvement of any aspect of the laboratory service. There is no disabled entry. There is no disabled entry. So one girl suggested, sir, we have to have a ramp for this so that people can be, you know, if they're, if they're coming on a wheelchair or if they, if a trolley is being brought in, it's easy for us to collect the sample. Okay, these are all the suggestions. Suggestions shall be evaluated, implemented as appropriate and feedback provided to the staff. Again, here, staff suggestion, one form has to be designed by the laboratory and distributed to everybody. And yesterday we discussed 4.1.2.6, communication. In that communication, everybody has to say what they feel. Everybody has to say. And even the quality manager, when he conducts a meeting, 4.1.2.6, in that he will distribute this, all these forms and tell the staff people, look, if you have any suggestions to make, please write in this and then give it to us. This is only for improvement of services, not for improvement of salary and other things, not that. Okay, it's only for improvement of the services of the laboratory and implemented and as appropriate and if feedback provided to the staff. Records and suggestions and action taken by the management shall be maintained. 4.14.5 is internal audit. Internal audit is, you know, this audit is something that is conducted by a person who belongs to the organization. Okay, so that is generally called as an internal audit. The laboratory shall conduct internal audits at planned intervals to determine whether all activities in the quality management system, including pre-examination, examination, and post-examination conform to the requirements of this international standard and to requirements established by the laboratory and are implemented, effective, and maintained. So here, we have to have trained auditors. When, audit, when internal audit is conducted, we have to train the auditors. In your laboratory, we may have to train the auditor. Now, uh, there is a four days internal auditors training course, which is actually called as auditors training course. We can even go outside. We can also conduct internal audit of another laboratory. Basically, we require training. And this training takes place for four days. At the end of four days, uh, there is an examination. Once people qualify in that examination, they become internal auditors. So here, what why should this audit be done? It is to see whether the laboratory is conformed to its own procedures. Look at that. The laboratory has certain procedures to perform. Number one is whether to see if the laboratory is conforming to its own procedures. That's number one. And also quality management system, whether they're doing as per their own quality management system. Are they doing things as described in the primary sample collection manual as far as pre-examination is concerned? Are they doing tests as per the as per the protocol that is described in the manual, which is which contains all the examination procedures, and also post-examination. So the internal audit, audit is done to see that all these things are being conformed. They implemented effective and maintained. Now the cycle for internal auditing should normally be completed in one year. That means if the laboratory has conducted one internal audit last May, that is May 2021, it is, has to con conduct one more audit this year again in May 2022 because the standard has given one year only as the cycle for internal audit. The laboratory can have more internal audits. It's left to them, but but they cannot exceed one year. Okay, the gap between two internal audits cannot exceed one year. It is not necessary that internal audits cover each year in depth all elements of the quality management system. The laboratory may decide to focus on a particular activity without completely neglecting the others. What it means is that the standard has got twenty five clauses. That is 4.1 to 4.15 and 5.1 to 5.10. That means there are 25 clauses. So each element of the standard has to be subjected to internal audit. That's what it means. So what is this note is very important here. 
the cycle for internal auditing should normally be completed in one year. It is not necessary that internal audits cover each year in depth all elements of the quality management system. So that is number one. Number two is that the laboratory may decide to focus on a particular activity without completely neglecting the others. That means the whole quality management system has to be audited. That's what it means. 4.14.5 continuation of internal audit. Audit shall be conducted by personnel trained to assess the performance of managerial and technical processes of the quality management system. The audit program shall take into account the status and importance of the processes and technical and management areas to be audited, as well as the results of previous audits. The audit criteria, scope, frequency, and method shall be defined and documented. Here, when, when, when we want to conduct internal audit, we have to have a plan. So the quality manager will generally have a plan of the internal. What, what is this plan? Which section will be audited on a particular day? He will make a plan and who will be the auditors and who will be the auditees. All these things he will discuss in the 4.1.2.6. Yesterday we have seen a communication. In the communication, the quality manager will call for a meeting and say, look, this internal audit will be conducted on these days. And this is the schedule, that is the plan of the audit. These are the auditors, these will be the auditees. And you will also take, you will also ask whether all of you are available to conduct that audit. Then you will say a checklist should be prepared. You know, when, when any audit is conducted, it is always better to conduct along with the checklist because checklist goes in a sequence and also it serves as a memory aid. You know, we are all human beings. We don't remember everything. Hence, we have to have a checklist. The checklist will consist of all the clauses, subclauses, sub subclauses of this standard. Okay, so that is what it means. The audit criteria is you know, standard, and the scope, frequency, and method shall be defined and documented. Please go back to 4.1.2.6. All these things will be discussed in the meeting and quality manager will prepare the checklist and see that the audit is conducted as per the plan. Selection of auditors and conduct of audits shall ensure objectivity and impartiality of the audit process. I hope you know the meaning of objectivity. We should not be subjective in that and impartiality means, you know, there should not be any bias in that. Auditors shall, wherever resources permit, be independent of the activity to be audited. For example, I am I'm, uh, I'm supposed to be working in clinical banking state. I should not be auditing my own section. Hence, I can audit clinical pathology or I can audit microbiology. Any other section other than my own speciality, I can audit. That's the meaning of this. Independent of the activity to be audited. See also ISO 19011. This is a free standard. You can go to Google and just enter this ISO 19011. You can download it. I can uh, and you can use it as a guide. The laboratory shall have a documented procedure to define the responsibilities and requirements for planning and conducting audits and for reporting results and maintaining records. The records we have already seen yesterday in 4.13. Now, this documented procedure will have all the details in that. Who will prepare the checklist? Who are the auditors? Who will everything will be there? All details will be there. Okay. Personal responsible for the area being audited shall ensure that appropriate action is promptly undertaken when non-conformities are identified. What is the meaning of non conformity Yesterday we have seen that the 4.9. It's a non-fulfillment of a requirement. Non-fulfillment of a requirement. Now this requirement may be either of the standard. Please note that the requirement may be of the standard, that is ISO 15189, or it may be the laboratory's own procedure, laboratory's own procedure, or thirdly, it may be the requirement of the manufacturer or the equipment. So if any of these things are not followed, it becomes a non conformity so non-conformity is non-fulfillment of a requirement. These are the three different areas in which non-conformity can occur. So look at this. Personal responsible for the area being audited shall ensure that appropriate action is promptly undertaken when non-conformity is identified. Corrective action shall be taken without undue delay and to eliminate the causes of the detected non-conformity. Actually, there is a format we, which we have to use to raise a non-conformity. I'll share the non conformity format with you later. What is the meaning of this format? Format is a blank record. Format is a blank record. Once we enter all the details in that, it becomes a record. So format is, it's a form actually. So we need to have a lot of formats for this. And one such format is to raise a non conformance I'll share it with you later on. Okay. 4.14.6 is risk management. Risk is to the patient. Risk is to the patient. 
Why this risk happens is, you know, it due to some wrong reporting. When this wrong reporting is done, it may result in wrong treatment. And that's a risk the patient has. Please note that patient has already taken a big, big risk by coming to us. Now we have increased this by giving a wrong report. And that results in a wrong report. And it, it, sometimes, you know, it could be even catastrophic. The patient may even die because of a wrong report and wrong treatment. That's the meaning of risk. So we have to have, we have to identify risk. We have to mitigate risk and we have to manage risk. That's the meaning of this risk management. And it's now mandatory. Every laboratory has to do this risk. The laboratory shall evaluate the impact of work processes and potential failures on examination results as they affect patient safety and shall modify processes to reduce or eliminate the identified risks and document decisions and actions taken. 4.14.7 is quality indicators. The laboratory shall establish quality indicators to monitor and evaluate performance throughout critical aspects of pre-examination, examination and post-examination processes. For example, number of unacceptable samples. The standard has given some examples. So let us see what are those examples. Number of unacceptable samples, number of errors at registration and or accession, number of corrected reports. Process of monitoring quality indicators shall be planned, which includes establishing the objectives, methodology, interpretation, limits, action plan, and duration of measure. The indicators shall be periodically reviewed to ensure their continued appropriateness. Now, the laboratory has to identify some quality indicators in the pre-examination area, in the examination area, and in the post-examination. It's mandatory. So they should have quality indicators in the pre-examination area, in the examination area and also in the post-examination area and monitor them. Note one, quality indicators to monitor non-examination procedures. Look at that, this is a very important note, such as laboratory safety and environment, completeness of equipment and personal records, and effectiveness of the document control system may provide valuable management insights, which means that it need not be measurable. We can also use these to see whether we are you know, have, we have quality indicators. Note two, the laboratory should establish quality indicators for systematically monitoring and evaluating the laboratory's contribution to patient care. This standard that we are all reading, you know, it's, it's system-based and patient-centered. System-based and patient-centered. I'm supposed to be working in a laboratory today, but I'm not there in the laboratory today because we have already set a system. Because of the system, the laboratory will not close down because I'm not there. So it is system-based and patient center whatever we do is because of the patient only not otherwise we will not do anything the laboratory in consultation with the users shall establish turnaround times for each of its examinations that reflect clinical needs the laboratory shall periodically evaluate whether or not it is meeting the established turnaround time now what is the meaning of this turnaround time from the time the sample is collected up to the time the report is generated that is the time taken and that is called as a turnaround time now we, we, in between, there is, a, there is a step called as a transportation. The sample is collected and transported, and after that only, it is subjected to examination. We, we also require the time of sample collection, the time of sample receipt in the laboratory. Why we require this is, in case there's a delay in transportation, we would like to plug those holes, because there will be, you know, there will be some kind of a bottleneck seat. Sometimes the samples come and lie in one place, so we want to see that these bottlenecks are sorted out. That's the reason why we have to have this time of sample collection, time of sample receipt in the laboratory, and time the report is generated. That is generally taken as a turnaround time. So we have to establish this turnaround time. And we have to you know, have a discussion with the users. Who are the users? Doctors are the users. Yesterday, we discussed advisory services, 4.7. Yesterday, we discussed 4.7 advisory services. In that, again, we have to have an arrangement with the doctors, meet the doctors and ask them, look, this is the turnaround time for, you know, these are the examinations. And they should agree for that because that is the requirement of the standard. The laboratory in consultation with the users shall establish turnaround times for each of its examinations that reflect clinical needs. The laboratory shall periodically evaluate whether or not it is meeting the established turnaround time. And turnaround time can be taken as one of the best quality indicators. 4.14.8 is reviews by external organizations. Now, some of the laboratories may have had you know, NABL assessments or any other inspections, any other inspections. All that is taken as external organizations. 
So when reviews by external organizations indicate the laboratory has conformity, non-conformities or potential non-conformities, potential is something that has not yet occurred, it is likely to occur very soon. The laboratory shall take appropriate immediate actions and as appropriate corrective action or preventive action to ensure continuing compliance with the requirements of this international standard. Records shall be kept of the reviews and of the corrective actions and preventive actions taken. Now, when we have had a you know enable assessment, what they do is most of them they also have something called as observations. Observe, they don't give non they don't give NCs. They say, look, we are, I'm going to put this as an observation. Now, these observations are considered as potential non conformities They are likely to occur very soon as a non conformity Hence, we should consider all these, that is, non conformities or potential non conformities which are actually observations. Laboratory shall take appropriate immediate actions and as appropriate corrective action or preventive action to ensure continuing compliance with the requirements of this international standing. Records shall be kept of the reviews and of the corrective actions and preventive actions taken. I need not overemphasize the importance of records. Records are the only evidence of activity. If there are no records, that activity is not done at all. Okay. Note, examples of reviews by external accreditation organizations include accreditation assessments, regulatory agencies, inspections, and health and safety inspections. So, as an auditor, what will you check? You have to read, we will not tell you that. Okay. So, that completes 4.14. Now, we move on to 4.15. So, uh, good morning to all of you. I'll be continuing with uh, for the last, this is the last clause in the management requirement and it is known as management review. Now, uh, we have seen that, that so many uh, activities need to be done in a particular way in accordance to the quality management system. Uh, we have seen all the clauses from 4.1 till 4.14. Now, uh, the primary, you know, the purpose of doing the whole thing, who, whose idea was it? How did it all start? Because the management was interested in establishing a quality management system. The whole thing starts from the top. It's the top management's prerogative. It is their interest. It is their wish that, and uh, you know, that the quality management system has to be established as per the standard ISO 15189. So, because, uh, because of this, they have, uh, appointed people, they have appointed a quality manager, they would have appointed a director and they will make all the, uh, they will uh, provide the lab with everything, with equipment, with personnel, with sp space and they take a lot of uh, trouble in order to see that everything goes on correctly. And uh, they want the quality management system to be established and to be functioning properly. So, at the end of it all, the management would like to have a feedback. How is the lab actually functioning? Is it going as per whatever is uh, described in its own uh, quality manual, in its own uh, procedures and so on? So, in order to get a feedback, uh, the management review is conducted. The management will sit with the staff and there will be a discussion and they will be told uh, by the director and uh, the quality manager and the, the some of the staff who, uh, who are representatives of the various sections, they will give you know, uh, I mean, uh, they will tell the management how it is functioning. And so this uh, management review is a very important activity. activity. It's a planned uh, uh, activity. So management review. Most of the times it happens in the form of a meeting. So it is very often called as MRM, but uh, MRM is management review meeting. But uh, uh, earlier, actually, the previous, you know, 2007 version, it was called as MRM. Or, now the, uh, the name of the class is just management review, but most of the times it does uh, happen in the form of a meeting. 4.15.1 general laboratory management shall review the quality management system at planned intervals to ensure its continuing suitability, adequacy and effectiveness and support of patient care. So this is an overview of the whole thing. The laboratory management should get an idea of how the quality management system is functioning and uh, this uh, review should happen at planned intervals. Usually, like, you know, like the internal audit, it usually does not go beyond a period of, uh, you know, 12 months 
and usually it follows after the internal audit is con conducted. And I mean, uh, they my, after that, most of the times the management review is also conducted. So it is conducted at planned intervals to ensure it's continuing suitability, adequacy, and effectiveness. So how well is the laboratory functioning? Is it following all the uh, policies that they, that were set forth? Uh, is it uh, I mean, uh, uh, is it whatever infrastructure we have they have provided, whatever way the laboratory is functioning, is it effectively able to cater to the needs of the patients? Is it able to need, cater to the needs of the uh, the uh, users, the clinicians, and so on? So, in order to get an uh, uh, main insight into how the laboratory is functioning, this management review is conducted. Uh, so, it is a planned event. So, there will be something like what are all the points that need to be presented to the management? What are all the points that need to be discussed? in the management review. So the input, it is called review input. Like if it had been a meeting, we would have called it as agenda. But since it is not uh, uh, coming under the title of meeting, it is just called management review. So the term input is used, review input. What are all the things that they're going to review? The input to management review shall include information from the results of evaluation of at least the following. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, it goes on to O. So each of these A to O, all of these have to be discussed in the management review. We have just now seen periodic review of request suitability of procedures and sample requirements 4.14.2. Just now you have been told about this. So this has to be discussed. And um, uh, then, uh, you know, for example, whether there is any need to change the type of uh, collection tubes uh, whether it is uh, giving adequate volume or whether, you know, they can cut down on the volume that is required and so on. Uh, so, and whether the request forms, whether there is any change that is needed to be introduced, such things will be discussed. Then assessment of user feedback. Feedback would have been obtained uh, continually. Uh, you know, every time the feedback is given, as I told you, somebody will be in, made in charge of that. They will be collecting all the feedback. They'll be responding to the feedback. All this information is Collated. It is all put together. You cannot uh, one by one take, take each and every feedback given and start discussing. It will be an endless uh, thing. So somebody will be uh, looking at it. They will condense the whole thing and bullet points will be presented. So these are the major feedback uh, points that have been given. And based upon that, what action needs to be taken will be discussed. Staff suggestions will be taken into consideration. Then internal audits. What were the findings? How many audits were conducted? How many non-conformances were raised? Where all these non conformances addressed, where, the, where all the non conformity is closed, satisfactory. This will be also discussed. Risk management. This again uh, is, has to be done. Uh, this is a, sort of, I would call, a weak area in many labs because people are still not familiar with what risk management is. And it's not a small topic. So uh, we have not gone into depths of risk management. So risk management is nonetheless a very important clause. Risk is to the patient. How we are uh, help in uh, how does the lab go about mitigating the risk? This is what has to be uh, written down again and discussed during the management uh, review. So what actually happens is there will be people who are made in charge of each of these bullets A to O, and they will make a uh, they will sort of present. Nowadays, usually a PowerPoint presentation is made. So each one will come and present uh, A or somebody will might present B, somebody might present. So like that, risk management, somebody will would have been given the uh, task of presenting the uh, data on risk management, whether they have developed any, uh, you know, uh, uh, strategies to uh, mean uh, mitigate the risk. What were the risk identified and so on? What were the strategies I got to uh, mitigate the risk? Use of quality indicators. How many quality indicators were used? What were the findings? Were the quality, do the quality indicators give a good remark, a uh, good out, uh, output showing that the lab is functioning well, or do the quality indicators indicate that there is some scope for improvement, all this will be presented. Reviews by external organizations. Again, if there is, for example, an enable assessment has taken place, each section, what were the NCs raised and what were the actions taken, all this also will be discussed. Results of participation in interlaboratory comparison programs. For example, if the I mean, definitely the laboratory will be entering into some uh, proficiency testing programs and the results of those proficiency testing programs will also be 
presented to the management. Monitoring and resolution of complaints. This 4.8 class, how many complaints were received? What types of complaints were received? How were they resolved? This again will be uh, discussed. And some of the complaints, you know, will need the management to uh, help. Uh, for example, if the transportation is delayed because of lack of people, uh, you know, who uh, the uh, uh, boys who bring the sample from one point to another point and deliver it in the lab. Suppose the number of the manpower is insufficient, the management has to become aware of this, has to be told so that they can appoint more people. So sometimes this, in, uh, you know, involves uh, I mean, uh, the intervention of the management in order to uh, for improvement to take place. So that is why they have to be told that, you know, this is the delay, this is a bottleneck, as Yasna sir was telling. So how to overcome that management has to support. Performance of suppliers, 4.6, yesterday you saw about vendor evaluation, uh, whether any vendor is uh, performing poorly and you have to look for newer vendors. So such things can also be uh, told. Identification and control of non-conformities. Again, this usually a table is made, uh, you know, what were the non-conformances raised, what were the uh, clauses under which the NCs were raised, what were the corrective actions taken, what were the preventive actions taken, all of these will be presented to the management. Results of continual improvement, including correct, current status of corrective action and preventive action. So what was the improvement that happened? Uh, usually in the form of graphs, uh, the, uh, somebody in charge, uh, maybe a quality manager will be presenting to show how the laboratory has improved, how it was the previous year compared to how it is presently. That sort of a comparison will be given to show how the improvement has happened over say quarterly periods, how improvement has happened and so on. Follow up actions from previous management reviews. Previous management reviews, they would have put some action points would have been told, would have been discussed and they would have arrived at action points. They will revisit those action points. Whether those action points have actually resulted in action or not, whether anything has happened or simply they wrote it down and forgot about it. So this again will be discussed to show that really follow up has happened and action has been taken based upon the previous uh, findings of the management review, previous year's management review. Changes in the volume and scope of work, personnel and premises that could affect the quality management system. So it's a larger way, whether they need more space, whether they need more people for working, fresh appointments have to be made, whether the place is insufficient, they have to identify and try to expand. So all these things, you know, at a larger level, the management has to think of planning to expand. That is again, whenever there is a need, there's a pressing need, the management has to become aware of that so that they can step in and help to improve the uh, I mean, the number of tests may be more, new tests may be requested for, and in order to introduce new tests, you might require equipment, you might require trained people, all these things will be discussed. Recommendations for improvement, including technical requirements. So, again, uh, uh, technically, how they can improve. Some of the methodologies, some of the equipment might have become outdated, there may be newer methods available, there may be newer uh, main, main equipment available. So these can be told to the management so that they can plan and have a budget allocated so that they can uh, see that the latest uh, state of the art equipment can be provided. Then uh, we, those are all the inputs that are given to the management. So each of these inputs will be discussed. So we have review activities. Actually, when the, uh, you know, session goes on, usually somebody will be writing down like, you know, noting down the major points. Some two, three people will be told to please keep on writing down. Of course, nowadays we have uh, even recordings available. We can, for example, a meeting of this talk, but we can just easily record it and you can revisit it. You can listen to it any number of times, watch it any number of times. So in some way, uh, the activities will be uh, either written down physically or it can be recorded so that it can be looked up, looked into again. So the review shall analyze the input information for causes of non-conformities, trends and patterns that indicate process problems. So they will look into each and every uh, non-conformity, why, why it happened. As I told you yesterday, I was telling you that the delay, uh, there was a delay in reports. Patients used to keep waiting and they were, they were asked to come again next day. So why was this happening? They go down uh, further beyond, uh, they go backwards, 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 and finally they trace 
due to the lack of people to transport the sample from where it was collected and by the time it reached the lab itself there was a considerable delay and uh, transportation time was much more and uh, as uh, if you look at the tag this information you can easily get and so uh, the uh, the management will be have to will have to take action in appointing more people uh, to uh, help in transportation so the period the more frequently the samples need to be transported so this loophole can be plugged so uh, why the non conformity happened you the will be discussed and if wherever there is a, I mean, evidence of what actually was the root cause that can be uh, addressed or that loophole can be plugged. So, uh, uh, strains and patterns, for example, let us say from a particular ward, always samples are uh, getting lysed in a hospital. Uh, that uh, let us say in a male medical ward, always samples which are, which are coming from there are not at all uh, uh, fit for examination. Many of them get rejected. So, again, the management will have to step in and uh, they will have to have a discussion with the uh, particular ward, whoever is in charge and the people who work there, these, the nursing staff or who is drawing the samples to see what was the problem. Maybe they require to be trained and uh, in the proper way of sample collection and so on. So all these things will be um, uh, discussed during the review activities. This review shall include assessing these opportunities for improvement and the need for changes to the quality management system, including the quality policy and quality objectives. So there, these are two important things that need to be looked into again. That is, every time the management review happens, the quality policy will have to be read out and they have to think of whether there is need for them to, uh, you know, uh, change, add anything to the quality policy or take out anything from the quality policy. So the quality policy itself has to be read and it has to be discussed. And so also quality objectives. The quality objectives cannot be permanent. They have to review. Uh, if there are say five or six quality objectives, each one of them, they have to go revisit and see whether newer quality objectives can be uh, put in instead of the older quality objectives. Some of them may be retained, some of them may be changed. So this decision is taken during the review activity. The quality and appropriateness of the laboratory's contribution to patient care shall to the extent possible also be objectively evaluated. So the whole idea is, are, is the lab, the lab is existence itself is true for patient care. So the final outcome is how well the lab is contributing to patient care. So this has to be, the overview has to come in at the time of the review. Are we, is the lab able to meet the needs of the users, meet the needs of the patients? And is a clinician happy about the way the services are provided? This is what needs to be looked into in a broad way. So we have the input, then we have the activity, now we have the output. So uh, the output of, from the management review shall be incorporated into the record that documents any decisions made and actions taken during the management review related to. So they will make a write down that this is what we are going to do. In response to this particular point, this is the action plan. In response to point number two, this is the action plan. Like that, they will look, look into all the, uh, I mean, uh, loopholes or whatever improvement that needs to be done and they will uh, take decisions. And uh, all these decisions, all these action plans, there may be 20, 30, whatever. Some may be very you know, what shall we say, a trivial thing. It may be a small thing. Easily they can do it. Some may be bigger things also. For example, if space is required, you cannot solve it overnight. If equipment is required, you cannot uh, bring it bring it overnight. Some may take more time. Some may take less time. It can be, some may be solved within a matter of a few days, weeks. Some may take a few months. So all these decisions will be written down or recorded. And finally, there are three only, A, B, and C they will be classified. They will be classified as belonging to A or B or C. A is improvement of the effectiveness of the quality management system and its processes. Whatever is coming under that, they, they will all be and put under that. Improvement of services to users. That will become one particular category. The third category is resource needs. So these are the three broad headings under which all the action plans will be put under. So this is the, the final message, message given to the management, the final commitment given by the management 
to say that these are the things that they will address. No, the interval, interval between management reviews should be no greater than 12 months. This already just uh, some time back I told you. Usually, like the internal audit, the same way, the, the same rule applies to management review. And usually the management review uh, follows the internal audit and most often also follows the uh, external audit. But there is no rule that it should be only 12 months. In the beginning, you can have management review very frequently because you might want many things when the lab is being started. You know, there are many things that the management might, uh, you know, uh, my, there, there might be a need to tell them the need for them to help, the need for them to put in their uh, effort. So, in the beginning, usually they have management reviews more frequently. And once the lab is established, usually it is a period of uh, not more than 12 months. Findings and actions arising from the management reviews shall be recorded and reported to laboratory staff. So, as I told you, these will all be written down. And most of the times, if there are, let us say, 100 people working in the lab, maybe some 20 of them might attend the, ma the management review because the work in the lab has to go on. Samples will be coming in and, and analysis has to happen, reporting has to happen. So, it is not any different from the usual working day. So, usually, some people will be uh, identified to attend the management review, but you, even if the others have not attended, they should all be told what have, they're also part of the staff. Definitely, they have to be informed that this is how the management review happened and they should be told uh, whatever was the findings, what was discussed, somebody in each section, maybe the HOD should call, call all the staff and tell them, see, this is what we discussed and this is the these are the major points that the management will be looking into. This information has to be passed on. So, findings should be reported to laboratory staff. Laboratory management shall ensure that actions arising from management review are completed within a defined time frame. So, each task will have to be told, given a particular time, a timeline will be there. Within this time, we will do this. Within this time, we will do this. So, that timeline has to be written down so that the, the, uh, the, uh, whatever improvement activities will go on as per the plan. So, sh there should be a plan for this time limits and it should be followed. So, that is about the review output. So, the whole thing is a very systematically planned activity and uh, discussion happens and the decisions are taken and action plans are drawn and action plans are implemented. And records of those implemented uh, action plans are kept and that again will go over to the next year's management review. So, it's a continuous cycle of improvement. So, that was about. So, uh, what you need to check is only the, you know, the, whether the, the agenda, whether what is the time period, what whether there is a evidence of management review actually happening. And whether all those A to O, all those things were discussed and whether action plans are there. And so, these are the things that you need to discuss at the management review. So, with this, uh, the clauses of management require comes to an end. In the next uh, clause, uh, we will be looking at technical requirements. Professor has come. Ma'am, I would like to request you if you kindly recap this complete uh, clause four. It will be very good for the participants so that they will be just having a uh, broad picture. Yeah, we can do that. Please, sir, please. Yesterday, we began with uh, 4.1 management requirements, organization and management responsibility. Now, this is a, actually, they're very simple clause. There's nothing to worry about it. Only thing is legal entity is important here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some time ago, in most of the laboratory reports, uh, we were putting a disclaimer saying that this is not uh, uh, valid for medical legal purposes. We were putting a disclaimer actually. 
But now we can't do that because we can be held legally responsible for our activities. So we require registration certificate there. And number two is that we should make a compliance statement saying that yes, we can be held legally responsible for our activities. And also ethical conduct. Confidentiality has to be maintained by everybody. So people have to sign their confidentiality and that's a record. Once they sign, it becomes a record. They sign where, where I, either at the time of uh, joining or they can jointly you know, have one record and all of them together can sign. So maintenance of confidentiality is very important. Then of course, laboratory director, it has to be, you know, a laboratory director has to be appointed. There should be an appointment letter for appointment. And also please see that there are two ways of doing it. One is somebody who is a senior person in the laboratory can be appointed as a laboratory director. There will be additional responsibility. Or they can advertise and get a person as a full-time laboratory director. There are two ways of doing it. So they have, to, they have to decide what they want to do in that one. So laboratory director has certain responsibilities that has all been described in that. Then management commitment. How does the management commitment come in here? And how, what is the evidence that they can show? The evidence they can show by conducting management review. Management review is the main, main thing because that it consists of all those things. So management commitment comes in when they conduct management review. Then uh, quality policy. Quality policy is something that they have to describe. And this quality policy, when they describe, that will have all these points. That is, is appropriate to the purpose of the organization. Includes a commitment to good professional practice. Examinations that are fit for internet use. Compliance with the requirements of this international standard and continual improvement of the quality of laboratory services provides a framework for establishing and reviewing quality objectives, is communicated and understood within the organization, is reviewed for continuing suitability, which means that they have to write a policy. Policy should say that they're going to meet the requirements of the standard in both print and spirit. They are going to meet the requirements of the standard in both print and spirit. They will, they will issue, they will see that the reports are given on time. Timely reports, reliable reports, reliable reports. And also, they should also mention that they will treat all the visitors, including patients and other visitors with respect. And they will meet the requirements of the local accreditation body, that is NABL. So these are all the things that we need to write down in the quality policy. Coming to quality objectives, quality objectives have to be measurable. Whenever there is a requirement of quality objectives, they should be measurable. We generally use the mnemonic SMART, S-M-A-R-T, S-M-A-R-T. What is S? S is specific, specific. A is achievable, sorry, S-M is measurable, S-M is measurable, A is achievable, R is realistic. Today, I can't say that I'm going to establish a world-famous laboratory. I, 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 it's, it's impossible for me. So we have to be realistic in that. That means S-M-A-R-T is time-bound. So let us say quality objectives are you know, defined for two years. After two years, again, we look at the quality objectives and there's a connection between quality objectives and quality policy. There, there cannot be a disconnect between them. And we need to identify you know, better quality objectives and go forward. So quality policy and quality objectives. Then of course, responsibility, authority and interrelations, you know, that is nothing but organogram. And this will say who, who's going to report to whom, up to what level you have the authority. What is the meaning of authority? Authority is the power to give orders. Authority to give the you know, power to give orders and see that they are followed. That's the meaning of authority. So we have to describe who's got the authority and who's got the responsibility and what is the interrelationship. That means it will be it will be shown in the form of a uh, it will be shown in the form of a organogram. Uh, somebody asked smart S M A R T S is specific. Somebody asked that question. S is specific, M is measurable, A is achievable, achievable, R is realistic, T is time bound. That's the meaning of smart. So please note that whenever, whenever quality objectives have to be defined, they should follow all these S M A R T. Okay. So coming back to this communication, I always hold that 4.1.2.6 communication is the most important subclass in this standard. Because every Friday you may have a meeting. Please see that every Friday you have a meeting or every Saturday you may have a meeting. And you discuss a lot of things in that. What do you discuss? You discuss everything that is going on in the quality management system. You discuss what happened yesterday, any patient complained, any patient you know, was feeling uneasy. All these things will be discussed in that. And that 4.1.2.6 will be the thickest file of the laboratory. 
because every week you hold a meeting. That means in a year you'll be holding 52 meetings. So it should be the thickest file in the laboratory and nothing should be missed in that. Everybody's opinion has to be sought in that. Everybody from the topmost to the lowermost person in the laboratory should be asked to explain and give ideas to see that there are improvements in the laboratory. After all this is done to see that, all these things is done to see that laboratory improves and we meet the requirements of the users and the patients. So that is regarding communication. Then of course, quality manager. Quality manager is somebody, again, you need to have a appointment letter for that quality manager. He may be somebody who's already working in the laboratory or he may be a full-time quality manager. So that's why the standard is given. The laboratory management shall appoint a quality manager who shall have irrespective of other responsibility. That means he may be having additional letter, but a letter is required because uh, for his appointment, there's a letter required. And also he should have undergone that four days training. You know, we have the four days in auditor's training program. That you should have attended. That is mandatory now, as far as NABL is concerned. So that is regarding quality management. Quality management system is the entire process, whatever is going on in the laboratory, from the pre-examination, examination, post-examination, post procedures, manuals, everything that consists of quality management system. And what's the meaning of quality management system? If you open that, if you have the standard, please open the standard. Go to terms and definitions 3.20. 3.20, it says, management system to direct and control an organization with regard to quality. Management system to direct and control an organization with regard to quality. The term quality management system referred to in this definition relates to general management activities, the provision and management of resources, the pre-examination, examination and post-examination processes, and evaluation and control improvement. All these things consist of quality management system. Now, if you go back to 3.18, quality. Quality is a degree to which a set of inherent characteristics fulfills requirements. As a term quality can be used with adjectives such as poor, good, or excellent. Here, inherent, that means it already exists in that. It's not something that is assigned. That's the meaning of this quality. So you combine these two, quality and quality management system, you know, the entire process, whatever is going on in the laboratory, that consists of the quality management system. Okay, so the laboratory has to establish a quality management system, write down the, write down the you know, contents of the quality, that is the scope of the quality management system. Then documentation requirements. Generally, documentation requirements means, you know, we have four levels of documentation. Level one, level two, level three, and level four. Some laboratories have got level five also. Only thing is they have to describe what each level means. Level one is always the quality manual. Always the quality because that is the apex document of the level. So this documentation requirements, which they should explain what, what is there in level two, what is there in level three, what is there in level four. If they have level five, what is there in level four? Now that's the meaning of this documentation requirements. Then that brings us to quality manual, of course, 4.2.2.2 is quality manual. Quality manual should address all the clauses, subclauses, sub sub clauses of this standard. Everything, not even one class, they should say that it's not applicable. Okay, all clauses are applicable and they should write down. Then that brings us to document control. Now I want to share one particular file. I hope I have it with me. I'll try to share it with you. Yesterday, I was telling about document control log. Let me see if I have it with you. I'll, with me, I'll show you. Document control log. Now, documents drive the laboratory. Documents are required to drive the laboratory. If there are no documents, the laboratory is not functioning at all. Okay. So, this is not the stop sharing. This is not the one. No, unfortunately, I can't share that now. Okay, it's not written. Uh, the meaning of this document control log is, you know, uh, clause 4.3c. All the documents that are in the laboratory that should figure in this list, particular list. It's called the document control log or register. And this log actually is a, it's in the form of a table. It will say what is the document number, what is the document name, what is the ISO class, what is the revision number or 
uh, version number, date of issue, all that will be there. And who are holding this? That is called the distribution list. So we should say who are holding these documents. Okay, that is regarding document control log. Now, this document, please note that document, documents can be prepared in different sections of the laboratory. Let us say there are four disciplines. In each discipline, we should be able to identify the documents. Suppose we have a document from clinical biochemistry, we should suffix it with, uh, you know, CB, clinical biochemistry. If there are documents from clinical pathology, we should suffix it with CP. If it is histopathology, HIS. If it is hematology, HEM. Because we should know how to identify a document. So the document, that procedure will include all this. Now, if I am working in clinical biochemistry, I cannot prepare a documents of histopathology because I am not familiar with that. Hence, the, the procedure will say who is going to prepare documents in histopathology, who is going to prepare documents in clinical biochemistry, who is going to prepare uh, you know, documents in microbiology and serology, all that. So that procedure will include all that. And also it will say, it will say how these documents are identified. So document control is very important. Please note that one person will be controlling all the documents and each document will have a header and a footer. Yesterday I already told you the contents of a header. Also I told you the contents of a footer. And all documents that belong to the laboratory should have a document control. Let us say, you know, we are displaying a collection of urine. There is a procedure for collection of urine by the patients. And this is, this is, the procedure is displayed in the washroom. This also comes from document control. It will also have a header. It will also have a footer. How to collect urine sample. So it will have all the details that are required to collect urine sample. It will be there in both the local language and also English. Everybody will not understand English. So you should have that in local language also. So this document control is extremely important. Whatever the, today we have displayed so many documents. You know we have we have displayed documents on the window side, window panes, we are on the door, everywhere we have displayed. All of them come for document control. We cannot display any document without a control status. If there is any document that displayed there without the document control status, that does not belong to the quality management system. Please note that. So that's the importance of document control. That brings us to 4.4. That is service agreements. You know, there's always an agreement between the patient and the laboratory and each request accepted with the laboratory is considered as an agreement. Okay? And that should be periodically reviewed. Then referral laboratory. Referral laboratory, you can see the definition. It is an external, external laboratory to which a sample is submitted for examination. So there should be a procedure how to select it. There's a procedure how to select a referral consultant. Referral consultant is somebody who's an expert. You know, your teacher is a professor, you know, of high standing. And there's no need to unnecessarily, you know, insist that he should be working in a laboratory with accreditation. No, that's not required. Only laboratory has to be accredited. Otherwise, if it's a referral consultant, no need to have accreditation for him. Okay, so that is regarding the laboratory, and there's a way to give out the reports of the laboratory. Maybe the laboratory may, you know, transcribe the report onto their own format, and they mention that this, these examinations were conducted by the laboratory, give the name of the laboratory. Otherwise, take a photocopy and hand over the original to them, or take a photocopy, give the copy to them and keep the original. So some procedure has to be described. All these things will be described in 4.5. That brings us to 4.6, external services and supplies. This again requires a policy. How, how do you go about it? Do you buy a new equipment? Do you buy a refurbished equipment or do you get it on loan? So that's a policy. And then there should be a documented procedure. Do you have a tender, you know, three tenders? Do you call for? Do you have a competitive statement? Then you find out who is the person who gives at the lowest and then call in for negotiation, that kind of thing. So procedure has to be there for 4.6. Then 4.7, advisory service. Advisory service is very important because arrangements, what arrangements you make with the doctors? Doctors have to be called and you should have a meeting with them and tell them these are all the examinations that you have. Do you require any extra examinations to be done? What is the type of sample? What will be the turnaround time? What is the method that we are going to do? That will be told in them. So 4.7 is not just a marketing. It is a technical also because doctors, pathologists, microbiologists, patho biochemists, everybody should be there in that. Because only then it becomes a meaningful, you know, arrangement. We, we can't just say this marketing fellow, you go and tell everybody, you know, distribute pamphlets. That's what is happening nowadays. That is not actually advisory service. Advisory services takes place with doctors and also the lab staff. Okay. So that is 4.7. Then comes uh, 4.8. That is resolution of complaints. We have a lot of complaints. Yesterday, Dr. Usha told you one complaint. We are using the same tonic and all the patients. How do you resolve this complaint? One girl only actually resolved this complaint for me. Very simple. She said, sir, we'll use tonic A, same tonic A on all the patients, but we'll put a layer of tissue and then put the tonic. 
So there is no content. And we inform the person who complains saying that, look, this is the, this is the action we have taken. So resolution of complaints is very important because we have to inform the person who had complained. Otherwise, same complaints will go on coming again and again. And these are all opportunities for improvement. So there's a policy. What's the policy? Policy says we'll resolve all complaints within 24 hours. That's a policy. Policy means intent. So we say that, yes, we'll resolve all the complaints within 24 hours. That's a policy. Procedure is required. We describe the procedure and also records are required. So policy, procedure, and records are required for 4.8. Also for 4.9, that is identification and control of non-conformities. 4.10, corrective action. 4.11, preventive action. 4.12, continual improvement. All these things we require documented procedure, except for 4.1. So as a person who's listening to these talks, you must make a list of documented procedures. 4.1, 4.2, no requirement of a procedure. 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, 4.8, 4.9, 4.10, 4 4.11. All these require documented procedures. Okay, whereas for 4.1, 4.2, 4.7, 4.12, we do not require a documented process. Otherwise, for all the other clauses in the management requirements, we require documented process. So this is how we understand the standard. You see, when we when we read the standard, we have to understand the standard and try to apply that standard. And what we do is we we actually decode the standard. Decoding is you know stepwise. We explain to you everything that is there in the standard. So that is regarding. Uh, Control improvement, then comes control of record. There are so many records that are required. As I told you, again, records are identified. Suppose there are four disciplines in the laboratory. How do you identify a record in clinical biochemistry? How do you identify a record in clinical pathology? How do you identify a record in histopathology? So there should be some way of identifying them. That means this control of records should say, give a list of records and also give in brackets who are the holders of these records? Who are the people who are holding these records? Because these are very, very important. They, 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 these records contain confidential information. Then that brings us to what we discussed in evaluation and audits. You know, periodic review of requests, assessment of user feedback, staff suggestions, internal audit, risk management, quality indicators, all that we discussed today. I hope uh, uh, everything is fresh in your memory because we discussed them today. And the reviews by external organizations. Then that brought us to management review 4.15, review input, review activities, and review output. Okay. So uh, this is how we have to recap the whole management requirements. If you still still have any doubts, please feel free to ask. We can allow. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for this complete recap of this clause four. Thank you very much. So actually, it is very much required because you know since yesterday we are discussing this clause four, and uh, you have as recapped the whole clause in one way. Now I think uh, the, you know everything will be clear because the clauses are linked with each other. So yes, now. Thank you very much, sir. So we have with us Professor D.K. Oswal Saab, uh, who are the, the who are this, who are the director in the Health, Safety and Environment Group at uh, Baba Atomic Research Center. We have requested him to continue because he is working in this health field. Uh, we have and earlier he was the director at National Physical Laboratory. He, is a, he was a chairman at National Aggregation Board for Testing and Calibration Laboratories. He is an eminent scientist, a lot of research papers, a lot of work he has done in the different, different fields of the sphere, sphere, human life, human sphere. Sir, thank you very much for coming and just uh, just give us your uh, blessings. I would like to request Professor Aswal to kindly say a few words so that sir, we can also be motivated, our participants can be motivated. Please, sir. So we have with us Professor C.V. Anand, who is a, who is a uh, retired uh, professor from a university. We have Professor Usha Anand, who is also the retired professor from a university. And we have with us uh, Dr. Vakandesh, who is all known in the field of this uh, medical science, medical research, well-known personality in the field. So thank you very much, sir. Now I would like to request you, sir, kindly say a few words. Please, sir. Please. Good, morning. Good morning, Professor Aswan. Nice meeting you. I hope we could meet physically. Anyway, yeah. uh, you're a highly talented and highly educated person and your services are required for our country. Okay. Now, thank you very much. I request you to say a few words. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, uh, Astros. Uh, and uh, just now we heard from uh, Mr. Anand about the various clauses of uh, this document. Uh, in nutshell, what we should be doing? You see, in medical laboratories, if we are making uh, some measurements, let us say sugar measurement, and if the value is correct, 
then all our documentation, all our management is correct. Now you make all the documentation, you have got all the hierarchy of the management as per the ISO guidelines, perfect. But I still do remember, you know, uh, in 1997, when I was supposed to travel to Japan and uh, we all got uh, our blood sample uh, tested. And uh, it so happened that my wife, Subar, was reported to be 300. So she was otherwise fine, but she got fainted. She thought that she has got the sugar now. So then uh, uh, we became very serious and uh, we got retested at two, three places. And finally, we realized that it is below 100. So, th so there was some uh, problem uh, either in the uh, sample management or uh, the measurement itself. And therefore, uh, making an accurate measurement is a technically more desirable. And therefore, uh, in most of the standards, we talk about the measurement traceability. Traceability of measurement that is unbroken chain to the SI units. Now, in physical systems, where we do the length, weight, measure, you know, it is a well-defined system. One can get the accuracy as much as possible. So one should understand the accuracy means what? Accuracy means your measured values are close to the true value. Now, what are those true values? Those two values are defined by International Bureau of Weights and Measure at France are the seven SI units. Meter, kilogram, ampere, second, mole, and candela. Now, the uncertainty in these seven SI units, which are not defined as in terms of the fundamental constant, is zero. So from these SI units, we drive the primary standards. And these primary standards are located in the NPL in India, NIST in USA, PTB in Germany, NPL UK in UK. And from these primary standards, then we create a secondary standards. And the legal methodology has the legal requirement to disseminate these primary standards to the secondary standard, to the working standard, down to the line. To a certain extent, uh, in the country, uh, this methodological traceability is happening in the physical standard, though there is a need to improve that also. In chemistry, it becomes very difficult because there are so many complex compounds, you know, the measurement techniques, they are all too different. And therefore, the concept of certified reference material came. Now, reference materials are the standards given by the NMI, National Measurement Institute, which is the NPL in this case. And these are certified by the NMI. So most of the countries, they have got their own trademark for the certified reference material. For example, in America, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, they has trademarked as a SRM, standard reference material. Nobody else can use that name because the trademark for this one. Entire Europe, they have trademarked as the European reference material, ERM. Similarly, in India, I was lucky to get that trademark for in India, and that is known as the Bharti Nirisak Drabya, BND. So BND is the trademark of the CRM for India. So we have done for physical and we have done for large number of chemicals, in case of water, in case of pesticide, in case of petroleum, in terms of coke, coal, minerals. You know, so, so, so many things are coming up. Now, the biological sample becomes even more complex. Because there is a matrix involved. Now, we might have seen many places that we have so many forensic laboratories, those they do test the biological samples. We do the fingerprinting of the DNA, we do the all pathological tests, we do the, all the swipe tests, we have got all, all tests available. But if there is a high profile case or any case is there, Finally, for DNA fingerprinting, we have to go to US. 
we are not able to solve our problems. And why that? That is because, let it be any instrument, GCMS or ICFMS or uh, FTIR or Raman Spectrum, you, see, you have all sort of analytical instruments available with you. All of them are liable for the drift. And if the machine is drifting, you can never get the actual result. So it means these machines need to be calibrated each time regularly. And that is how the ISO guidelines always talk about the metallurgical traceability. It means there has to be a periodic calibration of the equipment. Apart from the quality management, apart from the documentation, apart from the uh, rest of the things which Dr. Aram really beautifully explained to each and every one. They are very important. But the key component, in my opinion, remains the ability to measure correctly. If that measurement is not correct, no matter whatever kind of statement you make or management system you make, that is not going to serve. Now, one of the classic case was the Talwar, ROC Talwar murder case, where this, the parents, the servants, each DNA was matched that of the ROC case. And unfortunately, no conclusion could be drawn. Now, one of the reasons for that is that do we have the reference samples, certified reference samples for the biological sample? or DNA, or if you have a drug abused. Now, if you are testing his urine for the presence of the drugs, they will need a very trace amount. Now, those trace amount need to be detected. I'm really apprehensive because in India, we have not yet made those kind of reference material. In NIST, for example, they have captured the urine sample of actual drug addict and the urine samples are made as the SRMs and they are sold as a very, very expensive. So they know what kind of drug this fellow has consumed, what urine contains, because it is a complex matrix. Once anything goes through our biological system, when the extrica comes, that, that has all to be a different preposition. So it has to be a real sample. So if you go to NIST website, and then you will say that drug abused urine standard sample. So now once you have got that available, where you know that what kind of drug molecules are there in his urine, you can compare that with the, your unknown sample. Okay, so all our body fluids, whatever are there, they need to be converted into the reference materials. And unfortunately in India, that concept has not yet come. We are highly dependent upon the equipment which we get from the abroad. We assume that those equipments are giving the correct one, but that's not a correct one. The calibration, the exact calibration of the equipment that need to be done again and again and again, you know, that there has to be a periodicity of the uh, calibration. Similarly, the case of the uh, normal measurements, temperature measurements. See, if you, if you have got the thermometers made from the different manufacturers, they, they, they can show you the different values. And in fact, uh, when I was the director of NPL, uh, some grandfather from Bombay called me up. He got the four thermometer and his uh, granddaughter is ill. He has put all four thermometers under his armpit together simultaneously, and all of them are giving the different results. So imagine if a doctor has got a faulty thermometer and he says that you have got a mild fever and then the you know, psychological the person feels that yes probably I have, I'm ill and then they start diagnosing and if all the diagnoses are wrong you know this fellow will be given unnecessary treatment so the, the, the measurement the calibration is so important now at BRC we also uh, work on the nuclear medicine and uh, particularly for cancer patient, uh, when there is an internal cancer somewhere and we want to detect that. So what we do that, we give the radiation dose in a, uh, ingested in the body and that emits and we can get the nuclear image very well. So BRC is the designated institute for the ionizing radiation 
and the only sole responsibility we have got. So in 1981, to diagnose the cancer in the patients, we have only 52 laboratories or uh, medical laboratories across the country. And we used to do the quality audit. Now, each of these uh, medical centers, nuclear medicine centers, they have got a radionuclide calibrator. It means before I insert a dose, a radiation dose inside a body, I need to calibrate with respect to a machine that is known as a radionuclide calibrator. Now, that is our responsibility across the country that all the radionuclide calibrators are perfect. Otherwise, if it is underdose, you will not get a good image. If it is overdose, it will kill the patient unnecessarily. So we started doing this since 1981. And just now I wrote a paper probably that will be published within a few months time. So in 1981, we have got a very few numbers, you know, in some 50s of the nuclear medicine across the country. And only 22% of that, they were qualified as the calibrated radionuclides. The remaining were unqualified. So we do this quality audit every two years. So what we do essentially, we take a known iso radioisotope, we measure it BRC with calibrated equipment, and as an unknown sample, it is given to the, all the nuclear medicine centers across the country. And then we ask them, you measure the protocol given to them, first day, second day, third day, how many times, what way, this and that. Then we get all the results back. So it's like a, almost like a proficiency testing. And then we analyze that. So 22% from in 1981. Now I'm happy to tell that now we have got 93% of the radionuclide calibrate in the country which are performing very well. Not only that, now we have got 397 nuclear medicines centers across the country. So it means what? Once the quality audit of the radionuclide has given the increasing number of the nuclear medicine centers across the country, as well as the quality control on the calibration of those uh, radionuclide calibrator. It means the treatment as well as the diagnostic of the patients being treated with the isotopes are perfect. And that's why in nuclear medicine, India is now considered as one of the best destination in the world. You know, many people from the Gulf and other countries, they, they, they travel uh, India for the, uh, this kind of diagnostic and this one. So what I'm trying to say is, if we can do that in the nuclear medicine center, similarly, we should do for the rest of the <coughs> testing uh, in the in the medical field, and for that, the most important thing is that we should develop the biological reference sample traced as the BND. That is the need of the hours, and uh, I have been telling to the NABL uh, CEO, uh, Mr. Uh, and Banker, that we should do this kind of uh, manufacture. We should grow up this kind of manufacturer, those who can make the uh, reference samples. So let it be DNA, let it be uh, body fluids, uh, your serums, uh, your uh, creatinins, or whatever you uh, is there. See, until unless we have got our own reference material, no testing can be uh, done uh, in a uh, perfect manner. And all these need to be calibrated with respect to the NPL1, and that should be converted into the BNDs, what any So we started that program somewhere in 19, uh, sorry, on 2017. And today we have about 115 BNDs, which are not only used in India, but also exported many of them. <coughs> so if you want to make a good destination uh, for uh, medical treatment, medical diagnostics, the, the BNDs uh, do make a very, very good uh, uh, preposition. And for that, uh, the R&D laboratories or uh, the hospitals, uh, we should combine together, we should form a consortium, uh, the legal metallurgy, you know, we should uh, keep on promoting uh, these kind of things to the various stakeholders. You know, all the time, India cannot be a user. If you want to become a developed nation, we have to be creator, creator of all the reference materials in, in this particular uh, scenario. 
uh, unfortunately uh, all the time we import now we should also realize that uh, particularly in the biological samples because our biological nature is different that of the westerners so even those reference sample which import from outside may not be very appropriate for indian conditions and therefore we have to make our own one so uh, i think i was able to convey my uh, point that uh, the testing results in the biological sample is the key for the uh, diagnostics as well as the therapeutics the biological reference materials are still a questionable in the uh, developed world and that's why we give a range you know uh, if you see uh, most of the uh, test reports they will give you a range the range is given because the measurement uncertainty in biological sample is large so we give a range okay so when this because more accurate and accurate then we'll give like in physics in physical experiments we give plus minus this we define the uncertainty so in biological samples we are still not able to find out the uncertainties but we can define that range but until and unless we have got our own reference samples we will not even to comply that range and if testings are done wrong diagnosis is wrong we are giving unnecessary you know uh, taking a healthy patient as a as a you know ill patient you see one of the example is that there are many cases where the blood pressure machine was wrong and the doctor keep on giving that you have a hypertension and he started giving the medicines so healthy person we made him ill for no reason because there was a wrong diagnosis and it is seen that in india one of the major problem is, is with the correct diagnosis and correct diagnosis will depend upon the measurement and measurement requires the uh, accuracies and accuracies definitely require the reference materials or pnds if we make them in india and, and that is how we are going to have a uh, meaningful uh, accreditation of the uh, laboratories thank you and if there are any questions uh, you know we, we can probably i can answer them thank you very much sir thank you for your kind words whenever you are speaking you are always in a new way and we learned a lot from always in a new things what you told last time and what you told today all these things are new for us uh, sir somebody is uh, written in the chat box that they are maintaining biological reference samples as viruses isolated from clinical samples so basically i think some of the laboratories yeah who is he yeah from chandrashekar out he has written yeah. to that we yeah. are maintaining the biological yeah. you see it is very it is very important but these reference sample need to be intercompared with many other laboratories you see for example uh, when this corona virus uh, broke in and uh, the rt pcr tests were conducted you see they were as good as 30 to 40% false positive or false negative until unless the nist usa japan germany and china created the reference sample of the corona virus and all that was done with the international inter comparison so biological reference sample is good but they need to be done as a international inter comparison in association with the npl okay so i i'm not still sure that how npl is geared up for the biological samples but there is a definitely need to to have the uh, international inter comparison done if you have made a uh, reference sample but that is a very good uh, uh, compliment to the mr chandshekar rao thank you very much sir thank you sir and uh, certainly we will keep you uh, uh, with us for uh, giving us the knowledge information what so you have uh, shared today even we have dikshi sir also with us director of legal metrology is with us uh, and uh, we, since morning he is sitting he is also uh, learning, just studying all these standards so that the better better things we can do in the legal metrology and you told all it is are very well you decide you say that all these four 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 pillars of this country are very important whether it is accreditation legal metrology 
NMI and the standards body that is BIS. So when all these four bodies will come together and will work at the, as a single body, certainly it will be very good in our country. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for uh, motivating us and uh, be kind with us and uh, always bless us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Anand, sir, if you want to continue, uh, sir, you can please continue. Or if Dikshit sir wants to say something, Dikshit sir, Director of Legal Matters of the Government of India, our beloved director, Dikshit sir. Professor, our, thank you very much, sir. He's, he's left, I think, no? Yeah, he's there, sir. He's there. Sir. Aswal. Professor Aswal, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, See, I have opened one. E file and Ida, in the Obeda. In the Gothi, the lights are shaded. I didn't even know for point there. They're not in parallel with them. Can you see my screen, sir? Can you see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? One of you, please. Yes, 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 we can see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Pia Purapna. Our other guest. Now we move on. Please, sir, please, please be continue. Please. Technical requirements. As we told you yesterday, the standard is given into two major clauses, class 4 and class 5. Class 4 we just now completed, that is 4.1 to 4.15. Now we begin with class 5, 5.1. 5.1 to 5.3 are technical requirements, resources, the resources. 5.1 is personal. I have already told you that if the last decimal is 0.1, it is always general. Invariably, it is general. The laboratory shall have a documented procedure for personal management and maintain records for all personnel to indicate compliance with requirements. So, planning is required. Identify suitable persons and selection procedure. Verify their credentials and legalities. References and recommendations from candidates, mentors, you know, previous work places. Interview and selection. 5.1.2 is personal qualifications. The laboratory shall document personal qualifications for each position. The qualifications shall reflect the appropriate education, training, experience, and demonstrated skills needed and be appropriate to the task performed. So here we require, uh, uh, this can be in the form of a table. What is the education? What is the level of education? What is the experience? and what kind of training the person has received and what are the skills that he obtains. So all these things have to be there in the form of table. 
The person is making judgments with reference to the examination shall have theoretical and practical. And practical background and experience. Everything that we do will have some theory behind it. Let us take, for example, anticoagulant. Anticoagulant, we use EDTA, we use heparin, we use uh, citrate, we use oxalate, so many anticoagulants we use. Now, what is the theory behind this? How does anticoagulant act? How does citrate act? How does EDTA act as an anticoagulant? So, this is the mean of, meaning of theoretical and practical background. Theoretical background is Absolutely necessary for us to work in the laboratory. 5.1.3 is job descriptions. Job descriptions have to be specific. Specific. A laboratory may have about 25 people, and all of them will have some job to do. And every job is somebody's job. Every job is somebody's job. The best way to have job descriptions is distribute one white sheet of paper to everybody in the laboratory, ask, to, ask them to write down what they are doing. That is actually job description. They will say we are reconstituting the quality control, we are calibrating the equipment, we are doing the a daily maintenance, we are doing weekly maintenance, we are doing preventive, all that they will write down. They will write down everything. And if robotomist will say, I'm collecting the primary samples, I'm, I'm entering the register, I'm writing down the name of the patient, I'm writing down the number, memory number of the patient, I'm writing down the time of sample collection and then I'm transporting it. So these are all the jobs. Every job is somebody's job. We can't have anybody who doesn't have a job in the laboratory. Yeah. All those people who enter the laboratory at 9 o'clock in the morning and leave the laboratory at 5 o'clock in the evening, they will have some job to do. So we should have job descriptions which are specific, which are specific. Now we have seen that, uh, you know, documented procedures we have seen. Whose job it is to write documented procedure? We have to describe that in job description. You know, the, the job descriptions will not just fall from heaven. Somebody has to write that. So we have to assign that job. That means job descriptions have to be specifically assigned to everybody, including, you know, who will verify this, who will uh, review this uh, document, who will be the person to issue the document. Everything, everything is somebody's job. And who will train? For example, there are consultants in the laboratory. Will they train these technicians? How will they train? What kind of a training they will do? Is there a training, you know, uh, plan? Is there a training record? All that will be there. Then. So job descriptions have to be specific. Personal introduction to the organizational environment. This is something called as a, you know, induction program. Every lab will have an induction program. A new person who has joined today will have to have an induction program. And this induction program, who will conduct it? HR person will be there, HOD will be there, lab head will be there, and you know that will include everything. They will tell the you know service regulations, they'll tell any probationary period is there, disciplinary action, sexual harassment, everything will be told in that. Today, sexual harassment is becoming very common now. What are the what are the disciplinary action that you are going to take? So in this induction program, everything will be told. Finally, that person who will be who will you know, who works in the, you know, in a particular department, he'll be taken to that department. Again, interaction will be done there and he'll be put there where he's going to work. So this induction program will have to be there. Records have to be maintained for that. The laboratory shall have a program to introduce new staff to the organization, the department or area in which the person will work, the terms and conditions of employment, staff facilities, health and safety requirements, including fire and emergency and occupational health services. 5.1.5 is training. Please look at that. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, six areas of training, mandatory. The laboratory shall provide training for all personnel, which includes the following areas. Quality management system, number one. Number two, assigned work processes and procedures. A person is working in clinical biochemistry, how does he handle the equipment? So how does he process the sample? How does he separate a serum? All that will be given in this assigned work processes and procedures. Next is applicable laboratory information system. That is what you call as LIS. LIS generally is a software. So the person who, who develops a software will also have to give us a user manual. He will train the people and he will give a training certificate. So training has to be given by person who's actually trained to do that. So applicable laboratory information system. Health and safety, including the prevention or containment of the effects of adverse incidents. Okay, adverse incidents is something, you know, it's some kind of a, you know, any, any, anything 
that can have a effect on the uh, on the result. Let us say there is a probe probe has become bent. So these are all the events that will have to be trained about. Ethics. We already told you about ethics, and there is no need to stress the importance of ethics here. Confidentiality of patient information. Personnel that are undergoing training shall be supervised at all times. The effectiveness of the training program shall be periodically reviewed. So once in six months also, we have to have a review of this training program. Is there a need for training? Who is the trainer? Who are the trainees? Duration of the training, pre and post training evaluation details. 5.1.6 is competence assessment. Note 1, competence of laboratory staff can be assessed by using any combination or all of the following approaches under the same conditions as the general working environment. Number 1 is direct observation of routine work processes and procedures, including all applicable safety practices. Number 2 is direct observation of equipment maintenance and function checks. You know, how does he maintain the equipment? Does he wipe it clean? You know, does he wipe it dust free? Does he use any disinfect to clean all that? So, equipment maintenance and also function checks. Number three is monitoring, recording, and reporting of examination results. Number four is review of work records. Number five is assessment of problem solving skills. Some problem can be given to the person and ask him to solve. So, observe how he solves this problem. Examination of specially, specially provided samples, such as previously examined samples, interlaboratory comparison materials, or split samples. So there are six areas in which competence assessment has to be done. Now please note that competence assessment has to be done both for technical staff and for the supervisors also. For supervisors, it will be slightly different. For consultants, also it will be different. For example, consultant will not be doing this B, direct observation of equipment maintenance. They will not be doing that. So we have to include, uh, do they do they effectively communicate with clinicians? Do they train the junior staff? These are all the things that we have to include for consultants. They're entirely different. Okay, so this is these six areas are applicable for technical staff, for supervisory staff, and for consultants, we have to design a separate competence assessment for. Note to competence assessment for professional judgment should be designed as specific and fit for purpose. 5.1.7 is reviews of staff performance. This is we have what we call as annual appraisal, appraisal of staff. In addition to the assessment of technical competence, the laboratory shall ensure that reviews of staff performance consider the needs of the laboratory and of the individual in order to maintain or improve the quality of service given to the users and encourage productive working relationships. Meaning of this is people should not start fighting them. If they start fighting them, if they have differences, then this productive working relationship will not happen. That's why this reviews have to be done. Some senior people, you know, who have worked for more than 10 years, they'll start bossing over the others. And that bossing over many others don't like it. And that results in fight, that results in you know, arguments, all kinds of things happen. So that's why that's why the standard has said that. We have to review the staff performance. This is in addition to the uh, assessment of technical competence. And this, please note that productive working in relationship is very important here. People should not start fighting and create problems so that the work should not suffer. Note, staff performing review should receive appropriate training. 5.1.8 is continuing education and professional development. A continuing education program should be available to personnel who participate in managerial and technical processes. Personnel shall take part in continuing education. The effectiveness of the continuing education program shall be periodically reviewed. That means records have to be there. Now, this need not be, you need not send a person outside. There's no need to deputy a person outside. You have to have in-house only. So, continuing education should be provided in-house only. Let us say a training we do every, every week. Let us say every alternate week we do a training. Every other week we have to do this continuing education. Probably we can invite an outsider, ask them to come and give a lecture and see that, you know, there is some kind of a continuing education pro program and professional development. Please note that there's no need to deputy anybody outside. This is an in-house program because the standard says the effectiveness of the continuing education program shall be periodically reviewed. In the last six months, what kind of programs the laboratory conducted and how effective was it? So the effectiveness of the continuing education program shall be periodically reviewed. 
personal records records of the relevant educational and professional qualifications training and experience and assessments of competence of all personnel shall be maintained these are all records what are those records educational and professional qualifications copy of certification or license where applicable previous work experience job descriptions introduction of new staff to the laboratory environment training in current job staffs competency assessments records of continuing education achievements reviews of staff performance reports of accidents and exposure to occupational hazards immunization status when relevant to assign duties the records listed above are not required to be stored in the laboratory but can be maintained in other specified locations providing they remain accessible as needed so that completes 5.1 we move on with 5.2 So, uh, we have seen that uh, one of the important resources is the, uh, is the personnel who the people, the staff who work in the lab. Another important resource is the space in which you work, the infrastructure of the, your work area. So, accommodation and environmental conditions. This has to be monitored. This has to be we have to ensure that whatever work happens within our the lab, it the there should not be an, any uh, mean uh, adverse effect due to the environment not being okay. So accommodation and environmental conditions. Five point two. It starts with a general statement. Five point two point one. Ma'am, ma'am, uh, sorry to interrupt you, ma'am. I'm very sorry, ma'am. Ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, ma'am. If you if you we can kindly uh, go for uh, lunch break because lunch we already break. Break. okay. Sure, 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 sure. Right, right, right. You're right. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you, oh, ma'am. It's a good thing. It's a good thing that you you know I mean interrupted because otherwise by the time we finish this, it would have become very late and it's not right to keep people away. people you know. So we will we will start sure, at sure. two o'clock. At two sure, o'clock. Sure. What time shall we start? How many minutes? Two o'clock after one hour. Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Fine. Two o'clock. We'll come back and we'll. I'll kind of start with the next clock. Five. This five point two. I will start at two o'clock. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Dr. Aswal, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Professor Anand. And uh, again, we are meeting at two o'clock. All sure, the sure. all the participants will come at two o'clock. Thank you very Fine. much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Fine. Thank you, Aswal, sir.
Okay. okay, so we'll continue with uh, the technical requirements as it is called. We have finished 5.1, so I will be taking 5.2, which is about uh, accommodation and environmental conditions. It starts with 5.2.1 general. The laboratory shall have space allocated for the performance of its work that is designed to ensure the quality, safety, and efficacy of the services provided to the users and the health and safety of laboratory personnel, patients, and visitors. So this is the full sentence. So what is important that we know need to understand here is three types of categories of people are there inside the lab. One is the people who work there, the personnel, then the patients who come into the lab, who are the, of course, the patients themselves. And uh, then uh, who, for example, into the outpatient department or the phlebotomy area. And the visitors, some, we do get visitors also into the lab. They may be people who actually visit or people who come in to install equipment who don't belong to the lab, they may be coming in. So these are the three categories of people. And we have to make sure that the laboratory environment is safe and nothing happens, nothing, un no untoward incidents happen. Uh, which will affect the health of these three categories. So it should be designed. The design should be such that, you know, um, for example, if the people who are coming in to give the samples, they should be restricted to that area only. There's registration, giving the sample, and then they should go. They should not uh, have access to the rest of the lab because the patients need not, uh, should not be given access to the testing area of the lab. They should be confined only to the reception area and to the uh, so area where the sample is collected. Like that, each category of people, their uh, entry should be restricted to whichever uh, is, whatever area they are uh, allowed to. Then the laboratory shall evaluate. See, what happens is, if this is not designed, then if, the, if everybody goes through all the areas, then naturally they, it, is, uh, it becomes, everybody is exposed to the biohazardous area. So it should be designed. In a, very, in a way, the beginning of the, you know, you cannot convert a house into a lab. A lab has to be designed for how, for the, for the purpose of uh, being, becoming a lab. Only then you will have the proper way of, you know, ensuring that each allocated area, only the concerned people should be able to enter. The laboratory shall evaluate and determine the sufficiency and adequacy of the space allocated for the performance of the work. So this 
whether the space is sufficient or not. There is no hard and fast rule. It is just a subjective assessment. You can make out whether space is enough or spaces it is too crowded, whatever. So it has to be the standard has just generally told that you make sure that there is enough space. Wherever applicable, similar provisions for provision shall be made for primary sample collection and examination at sites other than the main laboratory premises. For example, point of care testing under the management of the laboratory. So, uh, what in the beginning, what this sentence is saying is wherever the sample is being collected, the primary sample collection area, that is where the patients come in, get registered, wait for the sample to be collected, then they give the sample, they collect the sample, and then they leave. So, there should be certain way of designing that part. And the other thing that is outside the main area of the lab would be a point of care testing under the management of the laboratory. Now, if you think of hospitals, there are certain equip equipment which will be placed in the uh, outside the main lab. There may be, uh, for example, an intensive care unit, an ICU. And in the ICU, you may have some uh, equipment like a blood gas analyzer. This is something which is kept very commonly in the uh, intensive care unit because there itself the sample will be drawn, arterial blood will be drawn and uh, the person that a sample will get analyzed without getting the without the need to transport there itself there will be an equipment and the, the person who is trained will operate that equipment feed the sample and get the report so these are all called point of care testing uh, analysis so there should be enough facilities for that also so for example uh, whatever is the temperature required whatever is the uh, mean electrical connection required waste disposal all these should be provided even for any other equipment that may be under the custody of the lab. Next is office facilities. Laboratory should have some allocated space which is designated as an office because people who work in that area, they will not be techno, very often they may not be technological staff, they may be receptionists, they may be data entry people. So they need not get exposed to all the biohazard because they don't know even how to take care of themselves. So separately, there should be a designated office area where you can keep your computers, where you can keep your uh, intercoms and so, uh, your, your telephones and so on. The laboratory and associated office facilities shall provide an environment suitable for the task to be undertaken to ensure the following conditions are met. So, there should be separate office area, either a separate room or at least a designated area which is, uh, you know, segregated from the rest of the lab. A. Access to areas affecting the quality of examinations is controlled. So, they, everywhere you should put some sticker this particular door you cannot enter unless you work in that area. This entry restricted only to staff. Entry uh, mean restricted only to patients like that. And uh, each place you should have some signboards to show that others cannot enter without, you know, are not supposed to enter. So otherwise, you know what they do? They have access cards nowadays using the electronic access. The you know they the moment they show their ID card that will have a chip and the door will open. That is one of the ways by which, you know, access uh, to areas is controlled. Automatically, then the door will open if the moment you show your uh, card to the uh, that to that sensor. That is one way. Then access control should take into consideration safety, confidentiality, quality and prevailing practices. So, why do we do this access control? One is to safeguard the people because they should not be entering the area where biohazardous material is being handled because they don't know what is biohazardous material. Secondly, confidentiality of whatever happens there should be maintained without which, you know, people will start simply entering and they will start looking here and things which they need not be looking at. Then, uh, of course, it can also affect the quality of work. If everybody starts entering, definitely the quality of work will suffer. So, because of these things, access should be controlled. B, medical information, patient samples, and laboratory resources, resources are safeguarded from unauthorized access. So, uh, you know, uh, the information that is there is very uh, sensitive information is that results that are coming out. The uh, In one place, all the reports may be kept, by, you know, ready to be given to dispatch. And uh, so, in some other places, equipment will, will, will be so sensitive that nobody should go there and start, you know, touching it and, you know, seeing what is happening. So, the resources are also safeguarded from unauthorized access. So, safety to the persons and also safeguarding the equipment. 
facilities for examination allow for correct performance of examination. These include, for example, energy sources, lighting, ventilation, noise, water, waste disposal, and environmental conditions. So these are the areas which we need to look at for the environment. Energy source, there should be uninterrupted power supply. There should be, the voltage should not keep on fluctuating. Otherwise, it is going to damage the equipment and also it may give, uh, give you know, samples, uh, results also can go wrong if the voltage is not steady. steady. Lighting should be there, uh, adequate lighting should be there. Uh, if I look at uh, a sample in, uh, when there is not enough light, I cannot make out whether there is hectare is, I cannot make out whether there is hemolysis. So, there should be adequate lighting. Then, um, uh, ventilation should be there. Otherwise, you know, if the, uh, there is a likelihood of aerosols forming inside a lab. So, uh, you know, there should be proper ventilation so that the contaminated air should be sucked out and fresh air should be entering. Because most of the time, the laboratories are closed spaces and everything, you know, uh, the, the air cannot circulate unless you have uh, something to uh, keep the air moving into the lab and out of the lab. Then uh, uh, noise, of course, uh, I mean, we all know that many of the equipment, they produce a lot of noise that we cannot help. But as far as possible, wherever required, quiet area should be there. Water is a very important resource. You should have water of reagent grade quality. Most of the equipment, they need very good quality water because they will be aspirating the water also. If you just keep, you know, just ordinary distilled water is not enough. What you need is reagent grade water, where water of very high grade for which, you know, you must have systems connected to purify the water before it enters into the equipment. Usually they have all these uh, millipore type of uh, filters, uh, which will uh, filter out uh, the uh, all the particulate matter and certain ions also will, will not be allowed to enter so that the reagent grade water enters into the equipment. The waste disposal is another area. Separately, you can have a session on that. How to uh, you know dispose of the waste itself? You should have a standard operating procedure and follow it very meticulously. And there should be records of how the waste has been disposed of. And of course, environmental conditions also you need to monitor. What is humidity and uh, what is the temperature of the surrounding area and so on. Then communication systems within the laboratory are appropriate to the size and complexity of the facility to ensure the efficient transfer of information. So if it's a small lab, just one uh, big hall where one side is microbiology, one side of biochemistry and so on, people can just talk to each other, communicate. But there are labs in a, a, which are quite complex. There will be one floor will be dedicated only to clinical biochemistry. One floor will be dedicated to microbiology. One floor will be molecular biology. Like that, if it's a huge area, you should be able to communicate because samples are getting distributed from one patient Samples will go to different areas of the lab. And if you want to, uh, I mean, you know, distribute the samples, get information, you should be able to communicate effectively. And if there is any problem with the sample, immediately I should be able to contact the uh, reception area. If there is some wrong spelling of the patient, I should be able to contact the person concerned and tell them, see, this patient name is not registered correctly. Like that communication is extremely important. If I want a resample from a particular patient, the sample is not all right, I should be able to immediately contact the person who has drawn the blood, tell him that I want a fresh sample because the sample is not all right. So like this communication is a very important aspect. How it communication happens either through intercom, uh, you know, nowadays uh, you even have through WhatsApp messages are sent. A lot of people have groups formed and they, they communicate through WhatsApp. The evening duty technician will communicate through WhatsApp and the night duty technician will get the information. These are the samples that need to be analyzed. These are, this is the reagent is going to uh, be exhausted. Please load fresh sample of reagent. Uh, so all such information needs to be passed on through communication. Of course, nowadays is extremely, you know, various ways of doing it are there and all of those can be made use of. Otherwise, the old style is to write, have a handover book. People can write in the handover book. One set of uh, technicians will write, give the information. When the next duty is a set of duty uh, uh, technicians come in, they will see the book and they will act according to whatever the previous batch has written. So like this, efficient transfer of information is extremely important. Safety facilities and devices are provided and they are functioning regularly verified. Now we are all familiar with personal protective equipment, how safety has to be maintained inside the lab, personal safety of the people who work there and even other things like fire safety is there. 
and how fi fire alarm should be installed and uh, fire extinguishing uh, e equipment should be there, how to use that in case of emergency, all of these things, training should be provided. And the personnel you have seen, how training is provided on various aspects. One of the important facets of training is uh, about safety, how to, what are the hazards and how to safeguard yourself and uh, what to do in case of some emergency situation. All this actually SOP should be written, training should be given, evidence of training should also be there in the form of records. Everything should be very, function should be verified. For example, if there's a fire alarm, does it work or not? If periodically somebody should check and see that the fire alarm is working like that. So for this also you can look at. For example, what is given in the in below is emergency showers in case something falls into the eye. What are they, what are they going to do? Uh, even a simple thing, you know, wash bottle you have and you can press it and put it into, into the eye. Even that sometimes may not be available. Or there may be eye showers, you know, which will put water into the eye because these are things which, you know, like the, uh, the uh, such a hazard that the people working there should know about it, get trained on these things. Walk-in freezers can be a very big hazard. Uh, what is what is sometimes very, uh, I mean, uh, what shall we say, scary to think of if somebody gets in, caught inside a walk-in freezer. Uh, that's a horrible thing that can happen. So these things have to be taken care of and uh, I mean, uh, without any of these things, safety should be a very high priority and it should not be neglected. Storage facilities, because we store a lot of things, we store reagents, we, we store uh, patient sample circuit for some time. So storage facilities should be adequate. Storage space and condition shall be provided that ensure the continuing integrity of sample materials. Continuing integrity means what? I have, let us say I have collected a sample from a patient for analysis of a particular test. That let me, uh, for example, that test we don't do every day. We, let us say we do it only once in a week because the test we, is, uh, uh, the kit is very expensive and we don't do it on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, immunofixation electrophoresis, we may not do it every day because it involves a lot of, uh, you know, the training and only some people in the lab can do it. So we may fix, it will be done on every Tuesday. So until then you have to preserve the sample. You should not allow the sample to deteriorate. So that on Tuesday, whatever samples that have come for the test, all of them will be taken out and they will be tested. So you have to ensure that in the meanwhile, the sample does not deteriorate. That is very important. Continuing integrity of the sample has to be ensured. Same thing for documents also, there should be backup. Just because the computer crashes, you cannot say my documents are lost. You should have, you know, backup. You should, uh, similarly, equipment, you should take care of equipment, rage and consumables, records, results. All of these are all kept in the lab. Very important, you should not lose any of these. So you have to take care of them. Storage should be adequate. Clinical samples and materials used in examination processes shall be stored in a manner to prevent cross-contamination. So what happens is if I keep reagent in one rack in the fridge, next to that, if I keep the reagent, then there is a possibility that cross-contamination can occur. Cross-contamination is usually a problem even in, let us say, in a microbiology serology lab and also especially in COVID labs where RT-PCR is done, you're all very familiar with how contamination is a huge problem and how the design of the lab itself has to be done. You have a clean area, you have a dirty area, you have a pass box, all those details have been worked out. The laboratory is designed in such a way that contamination does not occur because when contamination occurs, anything can be, a negative test can become positive and vice versa. So preventing cross-contamination so it's very important, the laboratory has to be designed in a very uh, specific way to prevent this. And all of us are aware of this, more so because of the COVID uh, testing facilities that have come up all over the country. Now, storage and disposal facilities for dangerous materials shall be appropriate to the hazards of the material and are specified by applicable requirements, national, regional, and local requirements to be complied with. So here, dangerous materials means what? There's something can be explosion. If you keep it and if the temperature starts increasing, that whole thing can blast and it can cause a hazard. So sometimes some material may be corrosive. If it if it if it spills on the floor 
and somebody walks it may it may uh, the person can get injured so these dangerous materials have to be labeled as dangerous hazardous what is the type of hazard also you should write is it inflammable is it explosive is it corrosive and in case something happens what to do these uh, these sort of information this information should be readily available it is called material safety data sheet m s d s material safety data sheet is available for each and every chemical each and everything that we use in the lab so this has to be compiled you should it sometimes comes along with the reagent it you can even go to the internet and search for that particular thing you will get information on all how uh, what are what are the properties at what temperature does it evaporate at what temperature does it start boiling and so on so this information should be available it also gives information in case it's falls on the scale what you are supposed to do and so on so material safety data sheet should be maintained in the lab especially if you are using uh, chemicals which are hazardous staff facilities 5.2.4 there shall be adequate access to washrooms to a supply of drinking water and to facilities for storage of personal protective equipment and clothing so when i come into the lab i will be coming in my uh, in the in the usual clothes which i wear from home and uh, i if i go work go into the lab with the same wearing the same thing and then i work in the lab when when i go back home i will be contaminating whomever wherever i go in the bus or in the in the auto or wherever when, when i go home and you no know, again all those contaminated clothing can cause a biohazard to people around so uh, i should be able to wear personal protective equipment and uh, or you know have a place if i have a carry a handbag i should have a place to keep my bag uh, some locker so that i don't uh, carry the handbag and keep it on my work table if i keep the handbag on my work table it will definitely get contaminated so these sort of arrangement should be there uh, lockers should be there individually given to keep my food um, i will be bringing my lunch box i should have a place to keep that i'll be bringing my water bottle so all these things they should be placed for me to store so that my things don't get contaminated for adequate uh, access to washrooms of course all of us are understand what this means when possible the laboratory should provide space for usually what happens is the dining area should be separate you should not you cannot have food or or coffee or water in the working area it is a very big uh, risk so you should have a separate area to go and sit and have your food or coffee or whatever when possible the laboratory should provide space for our staff activities such as meetings and quiet study and a rest area so if you have enough a facility have a separate area for a, a seminar hall uh, or something where you can have uh, or a library like a room where you keep all the things anybody who wants can go and uh, sit in there quietly and read and you know update their knowledge and so on so this is the a uh, good thing to have then this is a very important thing patient sample collection facilities the usually we do have separate area where patients uh, public or whomever uh, who comes into the lab to give their sample along with somebody they will not usually come alone there will be somebody else accompanying them they should have enough there should be enough space provided for them to come uh, and register themselves and there should be a waiting area and then they they can give the sample and so on so this has to be designed properly and it should this is called patient sample collection facilities patient sample collection facilities shall have separate reception or waiting and collection area so when i go to uh, i get registered until i i get my turn for phlebotomy i should have a place to sit i should not be standing near the phlebotomy and watching over what is happening to the previous patient because it will cause lot of you know the other persons will also feel very uncomfortable if somebody is watching so there should be se separation between waiting area and phlebotomy area at least the minimum you can have is just a screen you can have a screen so that others will not be able to see what is happening inside so consideration shall be given to the accommodation of patient privacy comfort and needs disabled access for example a ramp may be may be provided 
for people who come in a wheelchair. Toilet facilities also nowadays, if I am, if somebody is coming on a wheelchair, you are, and that person is supposed to give urine sample. If the toilet is having in some uh, one step and he has to go inside, he cannot, the person cannot go. So there should be at least one toilet wherein wheelchair can, they can go in and somebody can go along with the person and help him to collect the urine. So all these things should be thought of when you think of patient sample collection facility. Accommodation of appropriate accompanying person also should be there. You cannot say only patients come, all others go out. That is, that is not allowed. Patient should be allowed to bring somebody along with him or her. Example, a child they will be carried by the mother naturally. Even during phlebotomy, the mother will might feel like going along with the child. So you have to use your discretion uh, for these things. Facilities at which patient sample collection procedures are performed. Example, phlebotomy shall enable the sample collection to be undertaken in a manner that does not invalidate the results or adversely affect the quality of the examination. So there should be uh, enough facility for the phlebotomy area. For that, that person who does the phlebotomist, the, phle the phlebotomy, that is the person, the phlebotomist should have place to keep the uh, tubes, should have, there should be a reclining, I mean, there should be a proper uh, chair where, so that arm uh, rest, uh, rest should be there so that they can uh, keep the, uh, the patient can rest the arm on that. And there should be a facility for the, the phlebotomist to dispose of all the other contaminated material. There should be a place where uh, the uh, waste can be disposed of, uh, you know, something which contains a decontaminating solution like hypochlorite and so on. All those facilities should be adequately available. Sample collection facility shall have and maintain appropriate first aid materials for both patient and staff. So the first aid box should be available. What the first aid box should contain, the, the lab will have to decide. The usual uh, things that are needed will should be there. And uh, it should be kept in a place where everybody should be knowing that the first aid box is available in that particular place. There is nothing that keeping in the cupboard and forgetting about it. Awareness should be created that if there is a need, this is where the first aid box will be kept properly a designated place it should be kept and whenever required it should be refilled some facilities if we need equipment appropriate for resuscitation local regulations may apply sometimes you know the patient may faint when the blood is being taken because of some you know uh, uh, fear or whatever and in that case what the phlebotomist has to do how to take care what is the first aid that has to be done all for all this also training should be there given and sometimes they can have a couch wherein you know if some patient wants to lie down uh, not able to sit for a long time there should be a couch available for that patient to uh, lie down until he finishes uh, his phlebotomy and until he feels fit enough to uh, go out of the lab Laboratory premises shall be maintained in a functional and reliable condition. Work area shall be clean and well maintained. Of course, this there will be a register. The person who cleans will be signing with the time. So you can look at the register and generally you can uh, you can make out whether a place is clean or not. So a register has to be maintained to record the frequency with which uh, the cleaning is done of the work area, the work benches, the floor, the toilets. For everything there should be recording of the frequency of cleaning. The laboratory shall monitor, control and record environmental conditions as required by relevant specifications or where or where they may influence the quality of the sample results and or health of the staff. So all mon conditions monitoring should be done, uh, environmental conditions. And uh, what are the things that, that can be monitored? Uh, like sterility in some areas, whether it is sterile enough for the work to be carried out, which dust should not be there and should be periodically ensured that because dust can spoil the sample, it can affect the equipment. Once the, there is so much of dust, then the equipment will not function at all. Many of the auto analyzers are very sensitive to dust. Noxious or hazardous fumes. This again, there are certain areas. For example, in the histopathology grossing area, there will be some uh, formal and smell will usually very strong. How do you avoid that? How do you Ensure that this formalin fumes do not engulf the entire 
lab, there should be a proper area uh, designated for that so that the formalin fumes are uh, driven out of the area from which they are coming. So that has to be taken care of. This is an example that I'm telling you. Electromagnetic interference, radiation, humidity, electrical supply, temperature, sound and vibration levels, workflow logistics as appropriate to the activities concerned so that these do not invalidate uh, the results or adversely affect the quali required quality of examination. So you, you should be aware of what are the things which can affect uh, the uh, testing that happens. So accordingly, you should be able to design your lab. Uh, for example, if there is a centrifuge on the workbench, on a work, uh, on a particular bench, and uh, you know, uh, next to the centrifuge, a, a few feet away, if there is a balance, an electronic balance, the centrifuge will go on vibrating and the electronic balance will get affected. So you cannot keep both on the same, uh, you know, close to each other on the same bench, definitely because this will spoil the uh, electronic balance. This is something I have seen happening in many labs when I have visited, you know, that they don't realize that they should not be kept because one is going to affect the other. So this is an example of how it can, you have to plan where to keep what, which equipment. Even in microbiology sections, there are certain things which have to be segregated as well as cross-contamination occur. Molecular biology, all of us have seen now. Um, uh, and also, of course, in the, in the um, uh, artificial labs, we are very familiar with how it can affect the uh, contamination can completely uh, distort the results. There shall be effective separation between laboratory sections in which there are incompatible activities. Procedures shall be in place to prevent cross-contamination where work procedures pose a hazard or where work would be affected or influenced by not being separated. So this is the main important thing. You should have adequate knowledge where, where what you have to keep, what you have to do, how they should be separated, physical barrier, or sometimes they have, you know, the, uh, the pressure they maintain in such a way, a negative inside, positive outside, or vice versa. Like that, they maintain the pressure also in such a way that air will flow only in a particular direction. The laboratory shall provide a quiet and uninterrupted work environment where it is needed. Some areas of the lab are usually noisy because equipment are used. For example, biochemistry lab, uh, I mean, uh, I know that by personal experience, so many huge equipment, there will always be a noise of the equipment working. You cannot help it. So, but some areas of the lab, for example, cytogenetics lab is a very quiet area because no noisy thing. So those areas should be separated. They need not be exposed to the noise that is happening in the rest of the lab. So uh, examples of a quiet and uninterrupted work area include cytopathology screening, microscopic differentiation of blood cells and microorganisms, data analysis from sequencing reactions, and review of molecular mutation results. So these are some of the, uh, I mean, what shall we say, labs, if they have this high-end type of testing happening, you know, like molecular mutations and sequencing uh, reactions that uh, DNA sequencing or RNA sequencing, whatever they're doing, uh, these uh, type of, uh, I mean, la laboratories should, areas should be, uh, they should be segregated, separated from the rest of the lab so that they are not exposed to the noise of the uh, rest of the lab. So that is about accommodation and environment, 5.2. Mm -hmm. The next resource is 5.3, we go on to equipment. If you see the standard, open the standard, if you have it, please open the standard. Open the standard. The title of this clause is Laboratory Equipment, Reagents and Consumables. Laboratory Equipment, Reagents and Consumables. That's the title of this clause.
5.3.1.1 is general. The laboratory shall have a documented procedure for the selection, purchasing, and management of equipment. Now, yesterday we discussed 4.6 external services and supplies. External services and supplies. So, this 5.3 should be in red in conjunction with 4.6. 4.6 and 5.3 have a lot of things that are common in them. The laboratory shall be furnished with all equipment <laughs> needed for the provision of services including primary sample collection, sample preparation, sample processing, examination, and storage. Actually, this clause 5.3 is the only clause in the standard that starts with a clause, with a, with a note, with a note. This is the only clause in the standard that starts with a note. Note 1 says, for the purposes of this international standard, laboratory equipment includes hardware and software of equipment, instruments, measuring systems, and laboratory information systems. All these, whatever is going on in the laboratory, all equipment, including the, you know, our uh, LIS, that is laboratory information systems, all these are included as laboratory equipment. Note two, reagents include reference materials, calibrators, and quality control materials. Consumables include culture media, pipette tips, glass legs, etc. Note 3 says, C 4.6 for information concerning the selection and purchasing of external services, equipment, reagents, and conveyors. So, this 5.3 and 4.6 should be used in conjunction, in conjunction. That is, external services and supplies. This is laboratory equipment, reagents, and consumables. The laboratory shall have a documented procedure for the selection, purchasing, and management of equipment. It can be anything. You know, you see, sometimes, you know, we, we, we receive uh, 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 equipment on, on loan. We, we see equipment on, some people donate equipment. There's no problem in that. Only thing is that procedure should be written how this equipment came into the laboratory. You know, we have a lot of charitable organizations which, which get instruments donated from others. So, Procedure should include all that. Which are the instruments that the laboratory purchased? Which are the instruments that the laboratory got as donation? All that should be written. Management is how do they manage? How do they how do, how do they use the instrument? How do they use instrument? What are the records that they have regarding the equipment? Have they conducted? Have they conducted the what is that? Uh, you know, installation. Have they conducted installation? So there should be installation certificate. The person who installs will give a certificate, say that it is installed. Then we have operational. How to operate it? So user manual should be available. User manual should be available. And lastly, performance. Also. How, how does it perform? So all these things, that is IQ, OQ, and PQ, all should be available in the laboratory. The laboratory shall be furnished with all equipment needed for the provision of services, including primary sample collection, sample preparation, sample processing, examination, and storage. 5.3.1.2 is equipment acceptance testing. The laboratory shall verify upon installation and before use that the equipment is capable of achieving the necessary performance and that it complies with requirements relevant to any examinations concern. Later on, we'll discuss about 5.5.3, not 5.5. Note, this requirement applies to equipment used in the laboratory, equipment on loan, or equipment used in associated or mobile facilities by others authorized by the laboratory. Each item of equipment shall be uniquely labeled, marked, or otherwise identified. This is self-explanatory. Equipment shall be operated at all times by trained or authorized personnel. Here, the person who, who trains is, you know, generally the manufacturer representative. He'll come and train how to use an equipment. So there should be a kind of a certificate should be available for training. The, because equipment should be operated only by trained people. Current instructions on the use, safety, and maintenance of equipment, including any relevant manuals and directions for use, provided by the manufacturer of the equipment shall be readily available. So we generally have operation manual, we have also user manual, all that should be available. And nowadays, they don't give hard copies of this. They give only soft copy. So it should be available, you know, in the system where uh, instrument is being used. The laboratory shall have procedures for safe handling 
transport, storage, and use of equipment to prevent its contamination or deterioration, which means that you know, maintenance has to be done properly. Lab equipment calibration and meteorological traceability. The laboratory shall have a documented procedure for the calibration of equipment that directly or indirectly affects examination results. Now we have a lot of equipment which need calibration. We have a we have a microtome which has to be calibrated. We have a, a auto analyzer which needs to be calibrated. We have an ELISA reader which needs to be calibrated. So the, basically, the laboratory has to make a list of equipment that has to be calibrated. Now equipment calibration, the the, the manufacturer's calibration is acceptable. To this. Manufacturer's calibration is acceptable. Okay, so suppose you are using a spectrophotometer. That vendor will come and cal calibrate the spectrophotometer. He'll use different filters and calibrate it. So all of you know how it is calibrated. So this procedure should include all that. How how is uh, you know uh, our uh, laser is calibrated? How is an auto laser calibrated? How is a spectrophotometer calibrated? All these are instruments which are used for measuring. So generally, we have to have calibration of all these equipment. And the, here is where the manufacturer's representative will come and calibrate. If you are using the cell counter, you know, blood cell counter, that has to be calibrated. The calibrator is used by the manufacturer's representative, he come and calibrate it. The frequency may vary. It may be one year, it may be two years, it may be six months. So taking into account conditions of use and the manufacturer's instructions, recording the meteorological traceability of the calibration standard and the traceable calibration of the item of equipment. How, you know, in the afternoon we had the, the professor talking about calibration and meteorological traceability. I think we should invite him to again give a talk about this whole thing. Verifying the required measurement accuracy and the functioning of the measuring system at defined intervals. Recording the calibration status and date of recalibration. Suppose we have calibrated something today. Let us say, let us take cell counter today. Cell counter we calibrate today. Next year, again by this date, we should get it recalibrated. So it's always better to have a label there. Date of calibration, date of recalibration has to be there. And this calibration has to be done whenever there's any major breakdown or any major servicing done. Also, we should have a calibration done. What is this calibration? It is nothing but standardization. You should see that the whole system is working well. You know, earlier, we were calling it a standardization. That is exactly the same thing. Ensuring that where calibration gives rise to a set of correction factors, the previous calibration factors are correctly updated. In case there is any change in this correction factors, we should change it. Safeguards to prevent adjustments or tampering that might invalidate examination results. Sometimes what happens is, you know, when the quality control doesn't work properly, people try to, you know, manipulate that. They try to say do some uh, tampering and some adjustment. That should not be that should not be done. Meteorological traceability shall be to a reference material or reference procedure of the higher meteorological order available. Note: documentation of calibration traceability to a higher order reference material or a reference procedure may be provided by an examination system manufacturer. Such documentation is acceptable as long as the manufacturer's examination system and calibration procedures are used without modification. That is, if you don't change anything, if you don't change anything, use it as such, this, this calibration is acceptable. Where this is not possible or relevant, other means for providing confidence in the results shall be applied, including but not limited to the following. Use of certified reference materials, examination or calibration by another procedure. Mutual consent standards or methods which are clearly established, specified, characterized, and mutually agreed upon by all parties concerned. Equipment maintenance and repair. The laboratory shall have a documented program for, of preventive maintenance, which at a minimum follows the manufacturer's instructions. This is why that user manual, that operation manual is very important because that gives all the details about it. When should we do daily maintenance? When should we do you know, weekly maintenance, when should we do preventive maintenance, all that is given in that user manual and the manufacturer's representative will be aware of it. He will, in fact, he will telephone the laboratory and say, look, your preventive maintenance is due. So he'll be coming there and he will bring a kit and do that. So, but we should know the schedule of that. Okay? The laboratory should know a schedule. That's the meaning of documented program. Equipment should be maintained in a safe working condition and in working order. This shall include examination of electrical safety, emergency stop devices where they exist, and the safe handling and the disposal of chemical, radioactive, and biological materials by authorized persons. At a minimum, manufacturer schedules or instructions are both shall be used. This is why I have always been telling that having the user manual and operation manual is very important. 
whenever equipment is found to be defective, it should be taken out of service and clearly labeled so that others don't use it. So I say out of order, just like a telephone, you know, go to that STD booth, they say out of order. So that's how lift out of order. So, so that people should not be using it. You know, a laboratory is working three shifts. For example, the second shift fellow should not be using, it, which is already defective. Hence, this level is important here. Whenever equipment is found to be defective, it shall be taken out of service and clearly labeled. The laboratory shall ensure that defective equipment is not used until it has been prepared and shown by verification to meet specified acceptance grade. The laboratory shall examine the effect of any defects on previous examinations and institute immediate action or corrective action. 4.10. The laboratory shall take reasonable measures to decontaminate equipment before service, repair, or decommissioning, provide suitable space for repairs, and provide appropriate personal protective equipment. This, you know, what happens is when a service engineer comes, he does not know, he's not a he, he's a layman. So what the laboratory has to do is decontaminate the whole thing. And this decontamination process also will be given in the user manual. User manual will give all the details how to decontaminate the thing. And this they have to do even uh, when decommissioned. That is, suppose you want to contaminate equipment, you have to do that. So decontamination procedure is given in the user manual. That's the reason why we should have both the user manual and the operation manual of the equipment. When equipment is removed from the direct control of the laboratory, the laboratory shall ensure that its performance is verified before being returned to laboratory use. Suppose, you know, there is some major breakdown has taken place. Fine, it can be, it can be serviced, it can be repaired, and after repair again, we have to do whatever we did during that IQ, OQ, and PQ. That has to be done. Equipment address adverse incident reporting. Adverse incidents and accidents that can be attributed directly to specific equipment shall be investigated and reported to the manufacturer and appropriate authorities as required. Suppose the probe gets bent or there's a process error, so many flags come there, flags come. All those flags people have to note down and then inform the representative. Any flags such as process error, calibration error to be recorded. And here the laboratory should not take any action on that. Troubleshooting is done only by the manufacturer. So it is always better to the, you know, record all this and then inform the manufacturer's representative. Records. Records shall be maintained for each item of equipment that contributes to the performance of examinations. These equipment records shall include but not be limited to the following. Identity of the equipment. Manufacturer's name, model and serial number or other unique identification. Contact information for the supplier or the manufacturer. Date of receiving and date of entering into service. Location. Condition when received. Is it a new one, refurbished one, reconditioned one, repainted one, all that. Manufacturer's instructions. This again will be in that user manual. User manual and operation manual, both are mandatory. Records that confirm the equipment's initial acceptability for use when equipment is incorporated in the laboratory. This is installation qualification, IQ. Maintenance carried out and the schedule for preventive maintenance. Again, this has to be as per the manufacturer's instructions. Equipment performance records that confirm the equipment's ongoing acceptability for use. This is where, you know, we have to do uh, quality control, calibration, all that is required. Will do. Damage to or malfunction, modification or repair of the equipment. The performance records referred to in J shall include copies of reports, certificates of all calibrations and of verifications, including dates, times and results, adjustments, the acceptance criteria and due date of the next calibration and or verification to fulfill part or all of this requirement. These records shall be maintained and shall be readily available for the lifespan of the equipment or longer as specified in the laboratory's control of records procedure. Yesterday we discussed at 4.13. That brings us to reagents and consumer. 5.3.2 is reagents and consumer. 5.3.2.1 is general. The laboratory shall have a documented procedure for the reception, storage, acceptance testing, and inventory management of reagents and consumables. This is very self-explanatory. Reception, storage, acceptance, testing. How do you accept a reagent? What do you do when you accept it? Do you, do you process a con quality control? Do you process anything else in that? What do you do? So that procedure has to be written in that. And inventory management. Inventory management is nothing but stock. You know, all of us are familiar with stock. It's either in the register or it may be the computer. So that's the meaning of this. Laboratory shall have a documented procedure for the reception, storage, 
acceptance testing and inventory management of reagents and controls. The storage is done generally uh, according to the manufacturing instructions. In fact, on the box itself, they would have indicated whether it is 2 to 8 degrees or whether it is minus 20 degrees. So, storage has to be done as per the manufacturer's instructions. Reception and storage, where the laboratory is not the receiving facility. It shall verify that the receiving location has adequate storage and handling capabilities to maintain purchase items in a manner that prevents damage or deterioration. What's the meaning of this? Sometimes, you know, in a, in a huge hospital, we have a central stores. So, central stores person only will receive all the reagents. There is no problem in that. Only thing is, they have to have proper storage facility there themselves. Suppose the manufacturer says you have to keep it between 8, 2 to 8 degrees, the store should have that. Many a time we have seen that the main or major hospitals do not have central stores. So, what they do is, as soon as the fellow brings those items, they just direct them to the laboratory. So, they don't have the receiving facility. They don't receive it. Only thing is, they just verify according to the bill, according to the order, and whether everything is okay, then they immediately, you know, send the person to the laboratory, where the laboratory will be the receiving facility. The laboratory shall store receipt reagents and consumables according to manufacturer's specifications. 5.3.2.3 reagents and consumables acceptance testing. Each new formulation of examination kits with changes in reagents or procedure or a new lot or shipment shall be verified for performance before using examination. This is called a lot to lot verification. You know, even a, even a stain, suppose we use a Lishman stain, even that stain has to be compared with, with the old stain and the new stain before we start using it. So, lot to lot verification of all the new kits should be done and record should maintain. What is that acceptance? When do you accept? What is the difference or deviation you accept from the old kit with the new kit? That has to be written down and follow that strictly. Consumables that can affect the quality of examinations shall be verified for performance before using examinations. So, this is straightforward. Inventory management. The laboratory shall establish an inventory control system for reagents and consumables. This is a, again, I told you, this is a stock register. It can be either in the book or it can be in the computer. They will generally have the name of the reagent or name of the consumable and date of receiving, how much they received, lot number, batch number, expiry date, uh, balance, so everything issued, issue, anything issued. After issue, what is the balance remaining? So that is the meaning of this inventory control. The system for inventory control shall segregate uninspected and unacceptable reagents and consumables from those that have been accepted for use. Two separate areas have to be there. You know, in the refrigerator, if you are keeping the reagents, one area should say it is only uninspected. Okay, the other area should say unacceptable. So we have to have two separate areas. One area will say uninspected and separately, then unacceptable reagents separately. Third area you can have, which is acceptable. That means this should be separate in the refrigerator. Instructions for use of reagents and consumables, including those provided by the manufacturers, shall be readily available. These are pack inserts. We call them a pack inserts, kit inserts. They should be available. They should be initiated by the lab director, dated, and marked as controlled. So yesterday we saw the document control. All these come for document control. So the kit insert is taken out. And the quality manager or the lab director will put a seal there, put a signature, and uh, that, that seal will have a control document, put the date there, put the initials, and keep it there. And any time a new kit insert is brought in, they will replace that with the old one, because the old one will become obsolete. Adverse incident reporting, 5.3.2.6. Adverse incidents and accidents that can be attributed directly to specific reagents or consumables shall be investigated and reported to the manufacturer and appropriate authorities as required. Leakage, broken seal, not acceptable, the analyzer due to quality, barcode should be reported. Sometimes, you know, strong acids will be there, they will cause accident, they will cause burns, all that will be there. So, they can either cause incidents or they can cause accidents. Accidents will generally highly corrosive reagents if they are used in the laboratory. For example, in histopathology, they use corrosive reagent. So, the laboratory people should be extremely careful in handling these reagents. Records 5.3.2.7. Records should be maintained for each reagent and consumable that contributes to the performance of examinations. These records will include but not be limited to the following identity of the reagent or consumable, manufacturer's name and batch code or lot number, contact information for the supplier or the manufacturer, date of receiving, the expiry date, 
data receiving into service and where applicable, the date and met the material was taken out of service, condition when received, for example, acceptable or damaged, manufacturer's instructions, records that confirm the reagents or consumables initial acceptance for use, performance records that confirm the reagents or consumables ongoing acceptance for use. So what do they do? You know, they have quality control and maybe retain samples, they will do all that. So performance records should contain all this. The retain samples, they may re-examine. Re uh, generally, they'll be doing quality control every day. Where the laboratory uses reagents prepared, completed in-house, such as Leishman stain or sometimes, you know, Benedict's reagent, maybe any other reagent that the laboratory prepares. The records shall include the, in addition to the relevant information about reference to the person or persons undertaking their preparation and the date of preparation. That brings us to 5.4, pre-examination processes. Now the processes start, processes start now. So 5.4 is pre-examination processes. Please note that pre-processes, all the procedures, all the procedures have to be- Sir, I think, uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, this 5.4 clause, uh, you will continue or Dr. Venkatesh will uh, take? Has he joined? He had gone out somewhere. Yes, 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 sir. He has already joined. Okay. If he's, if he's ready to take, then no problem. Dr. Venkatesh, Dr. Venkatesh, sorry, I am interrupting you. Dr. Venkatesh, your, sir, your speaker is off. Your mic is off. I'll do, Dr. Venkatesh. I'll do one thing. I'll continue. Let him take 5.6, 5.5. 5. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll continue. Okay, so, please, sir, please. 5.4 is pre-examination processes. Now, what is a process? Process is made up of several procedures. Please make a note of that. A process is made up of several procedures. And these procedures, let us say there are five or six procedures. Output of one procedure will be the input for the next procedure. And output for the sec output of the second one will be the input for the third procedure, and so on like that, it goes on. So a process is made up of several procedures. Okay, hence we have pre-examination processes. If you open the standard, Open the standard, open the standard and go to terms and definitions. 3.17, open the standard, please. Open the standard, go to definition 3.17. Process, a set of inherent interrelated or interacting activities which transform inputs into outputs. Inputs to a process are generally outputs of other processes. This definition is adapted from ISO. 9000 2005 definition 3.4.1 so we have seen the definition of a process but please note that all processes will be made up of several procedures let us take pre-examination process there may be about five or six procedures in that and one procedure will lead to the next one which will lead to the next one which will lead to the next one hence a process is completed process is completed and we are expected to write a process flow chart for this in the pre-examination area, what are the procedures that take place? Hence, we, we have to write down a process flow chart. And also, these pre-examination processes will be contained in a document which is called as a primary sample collection manual. Primary sample collection manual. So, 5.4 full clause will be contained in primary sample collection manual which is a control document and it is a level two document. Please make a note of that. It's a level two document because in the quality manual, which is a level one document, when we come to 5.4, 5.4 class in the quality manual, there the quality manual will mention saying that pre-examination processes are all described in primary sample collection manual. That is the reference that we have to keep because Quality manual will not contain any processes. They will only make references. We saw already that we already saw that in 4.2.2.2, the quality manual shall make reference to both managerial and technical activities. Hence, this is one of the activities. So, quality manual. When we come to 5.4 in quality manual, we have to say that the pre-examination processes are all described in primary sample collection manual, which is a level two document. 5.4.1 is general. The laboratory shall have documented procedures and information for pre-examination activities to ensure the validity of the results of examinations. So, documented procedures. 
what is this pre-examination? Before the samples are processed, we have what we call as pre-examination process. So we have to have procedures. And where will they be? They will be in the primary sample collection manual only. Okay. So please make a note of that. 5.4.1. 5.4.2 is information for patients and users. The laboratory shall have information available for patients and users of the laboratory services. The information shall include as appropriate the location of the laboratory. Why is this required? This is required for the, so that the patients can reach the laboratory. Suppose, suppose you are all working in a hospital which has got about five floors. And where is the laboratory located? The patient should know about it. So there should be a signage. There should be a signage in the ground floor itself saying that the laboratory is located on the third floor. So there should be a signage there. So location of the laboratory has to be indicated. In addition to that, if the if the patient wants to give a police complaint against the laboratory, they should know where the laboratory is existing. So please note that for two reasons, we should know where the location of the laboratory is. Types of clinical services offered by the laboratory, including examinations, refer to other laboratories. The okay, types of services. Now, let us say a laboratory has got four disciplines. It has got clinical biochemistry, it has got clinical pathology, it has got hematology, it has got microbiology and serology, but it does not have histopathology. So, uh, th there should be a name board. There should be a board saying that facilities available in this laboratory are these. Facilities not available is histopathology. So, types of clinical services offered by the laboratory, including examinations referred to other laboratories. Opening hours of the laboratory. Most of the laboratories open early in the morning, say about six o'clock or so, and they close by about five o'clock or six o'clock. So opening hours of the laboratory have to be displayed. The examinations offered by the laboratory, including as appropriate information concerning sample required, primary sample volumes, special precautions, turnaround time, which may also be provided in general categories or for groups of examinations, biological reference intervals, and clinical decision values. Now let's see each one of these here. Primary sample volumes. Information concerning sample required, primary sample. Primary sample is a sample that is collected as such from the patient. Suppose you are collecting blood, whole blood is the primary sample. Suppose you are collecting urine, 24 hours urine, it may, it may, it may be about 2 liters. So that is a primary sample. Sample collected as such from the patient, first we collect. We collect a specimen, you know, biopsy specimen. We collect the bone marrow, all that. This, all these are referred to as a primary sample. So the, the, Primary sample collection manual will have procedures only for the collection of primary sample. We are not bothered about the subsample. Subsample is, you know, serum, plasma, any aliquot that we take out of that, that is a subsample. The standard is not bothered about it. Standard is bothered only about the primary sample required. Okay. Primary sample volumes. How much is required? How much should be? How much is required for CBC? That is complete blood count. How much is required for platelet count alone? If you are doing. All that has to be done. How much is required for blood sugar? How much is required for kidney function test? How much is required for serology test? So all that, that means primary sample volumes, special precautions and turnaround time, which may also be provided in general categories or for groups of examination. What's the meaning of this? Now we have, let us say we have a liver function test. Liver function test has about five tests. And total protein and albumin globulin ratio is also part of that. So we have to give a turnaround time for LFT, that is liver function test, and also separately for total protein and age ratio. That's the meaning of this, provided in general categories or for groups of exactly. Similarly, uh, total CBC, that is, you know, complete blood count we do. Turnaround time for CBC has to be given. If you are doing separately hemoglobin, that also has to be given separate because it's, it is taken as general categories or for groups of exactly. Biological reference intervals. Meaning of this is so-called normal value. Earlier we were calling this as normal value. Although we still feel that it is a normal value, but still the standard says we have to give biological reference intervals. That is so-called as a normal value. And clinical decision values. What's the difference between the two? Biological reference intervals are so-called normal range, whereas clinical decision values is where a clinician's intervention is required. Let us say, for example, you know, after one uh, sir, doctor was telling, Professor, uh, uh, he was telling that his wife had 300 milligrams. Now, 300 milligrams of sugar is a clinical decision value because the doctor has to intervene, has to treat the patient. Okay, so we have to distinguish between biological reference intervals and clinical decision values. And where will this be? They will be in the primary sample collection manual. We have still not left that primary sample collection manual. Instructions for completion of the request form. Here, doctors will complete the request form. The laboratory has to have a request form. And doctors will enter all the details in the request form and instructions have to be given to the doctors how to complete the request form. 
instructions for preparation of the patient. How do you want the patient to come? Do you want the patient to drink one liter of water and come to the laboratory? Do you want the patient to come on an empty stomach? Do you want the patient to have some food and come? Do you want the patient to eat two idlis and come? Do you want the patient to have 100 grams of glucose and come? So, instructions for preparation of the patient. You must very clearly give how patient has to reach the laboratory. Instructions for patient collect samples. This is so important here. Patient collect samples. What do they collect? They collect urine. They collect sputum. They collect semen. Okay. They collect uh, anything else they collect? I think uh, stools. They collect stool samples. So, how, how should they collect? What is the procedure they should do? They should follow. These instructions have to be displayed in the washroom because this is that is where they collect. In the washroom, instructions for patient collected samples have to be displayed. And this will come for document control. It will have a header and a footer, and also the procedure is given. In fact, it is always better to instruct by means of a diagram. Show them what is the meaning of because you know many a time they tell you go and collect uh, midstream urine and come. Hey, nobody knows what is a midstream urine. How to collect a midstream urine? So unless we demonstrate that, give in the form of a diagram, patients will not be able to know because patients are all lame and they do not know anything. Then other thing is when when the when the patients collect urine, how how do they clean the area? How do they clean the area? And the cleaning is different for male patients and female patients. In fact, it is very embarrassing for a male, male person to explain these things to a female patient. Hence, in the phlebotomy room, always it is better to have some men and also some women. So, they should be able to tell the female patients how to clean the area, how to, whether it is from front to back or back to front before collecting the urine. All that is very important here. So, instructions of basic collection samples are extremely important here. And this has to be displayed in the washroom in both the local language and in English. And that comes from document control. Header will be there, put up in there. And also, you know, diagrams will be there to show how to collect the urine, how to collect stool, how to collect uh, cement, how to collect sputum. Everything will be there. In there. Okay, so that's the instructions for patient collected samples. And this also will be present in the primary sample collection manual. Instructions for transportation of samples, including any special handling needs. Generally, the samples are all transported in an upright condition. They should not be lying down. They should all in an upright condition. So, instructions for transportation of samples, including any special handling needs. Here, you know, many a time we have seen where samples will be lying down, all the blood will be sticking to the sides, and that's all not bad practices. They should all be standing in an upright position. They should all be in a rack. In a rack, and that rack should be in a box. That box should have a lid. That lid, that lid should have a handle, handle, and then the box should be tightly closed. And there should be a biohazard sticker for that. Only then they should be transported. Okay. So all these are mandatory instructions for transportation of samples, including a special handling needs. Any requirements for patient consent, for example, consent to disclose clinical information and family history to relevant healthcare professionals. Where referral is needed. Consent. Uh, we'll talk about it later. The laboratory's criteria for accepting and rejecting samples. What are the samples that we reject? What are the samples that we accept? Underfilled samples, overfilled samples, clotted samples, without label, wrong label, all this we reject. So there should be clear cut acceptance and rejection criteria described. A list of factors known to significantly affect the performance of the examination or the interpretation of the result. Sometimes what we have what we call as master health check. That master health check, morning they come and give us a fasting sample and then they have, have a breakfast. After breakfast, they go for treadmill testing. That's because it's a part of the uh, master health check. So when they do the treadmill testing and after two hours, they come back for postprandial sugar. Invariably, the postprandial sugar will be lower than that of fasting sugar. That is when the patient starts waiting. What is this? I say you do not even know this. You don't have a common sense. You are given a lower postprandial sugar and have a higher fasting sugar. That is not the fault of the laboratory. It is because the list of factors known to significantly affect was not explained to them. It's not explained to them. So the laboratory should be very very careful in this. They should explain to the patient. Look, you are going for a treadmill testing. In case you come back, your postprandial sugar is likely to be lower than that of fasting. So, a list of factors known to significantly affect the performance of the examination or the interpretation of the result. Availability of clinical advice on ordering of examinations and on interpretation of examination results. Yesterday, we discussed 4.7 advisory services. It's always better for some pathologist or a biochemist or a microbiologist to be available at the uh, robotomy room where patients come there because some of these clarifications can be done only by them. 
the laboratory's policy on protection of personal information. Yesterday we have seen that, you know, confidentiality. The laboratory's complaint procedure, 4.8, yesterday we discussed that complaint procedure has to be available. The laboratory shall have information available for patients and users that includes an explanation of the clinical procedure to be performed to enable informed consent. Look at this. Phlebotomist in the outpatient room will explain the procedure. Staff nurse in the world will explain because in most of the hospitals, staff nurses only conduct, uh, collect the samples. Whereas in the phlebotomy room, uh, phlebotomist will collect. You know, they're all trained technicians, they will collect. But these are the people who will explain the procedure to the patient. patient has to be explained what is the procedure they are going to conduct. Importance of provision of patient and family information where relevant, for example, for interpreting genetic examination results shall be explained to the patient and used. This is, of course, self-explanatory. Request form 5.4.3. All laboratories will have request form. There are two types of laboratories. I don't know whether you have heard of this. One is a standalone laboratory. That is, they are not attached to any hospital. There is a standalone laboratory. The other laboratory is a hospital-based laboratory. Hospital-based laboratory. Hospital-based laboratory, there is no problem in that because all patients will have a request form. Whereas standalone laboratories, we have what we call as walk-in patients. They just come and say, come on, do my HPA1C, come on, do my CBC, come on, do my uh, platelet count, do my uh, what is that uh, serology testing, uh, we avoid all tests. So they tell you. That means they are all walk-in patients. They don't have any request form, but they come and request the laboratory. In that case, the laboratory should accept whatever they say and generate a request form. They can generate a request form. So there are two types of laboratories and two types of request forms. One is a hard copy, that is print version. The second one is electronic equivalent. Nowadays, in most of the hospitals, they practice electronic equivalent. You know, what they do is they enter everything in the uh, computer only and they'll save it. The moment they save it, the laboratory person will open it with their own password and then they know what are the tests to be done. By that time, barcode would have been printed, the sample would have reached the laboratory. So, Request form or an electronic equivalent shall allow space for the inclusion of, but not be limited to the following. What are those? Patient identification, including gender, date of birth, and the location, contact details of the patient, and a unique identifier. Nowadays, they collect other number everywhere. So it's always better for the patient to carry an other number. Unique identification includes an alpha and or numerical identifier, such as hospital number or personal system. Hospital number will be there in a hospital-based laboratory, whereas in a standard laboratory, maybe they, they won't have, but still other number is good enough. Name or other unique identifier of clinician, healthcare provider, or other person legally authorized to request examinations or use medical information together with a destination for the report and uh, contact details. Here again, we have to be realistic in this. Walking patients may not have any, any requester's name. They will say, I am the person who is asking you to do blood sugar on me. I am the person who is asking you to do HbA1cm. So we have to accept that. Whereas in a hospital-based laboratory, we will always know who is the doctor who has prescribed. Hence, there are two types here also. That is, unique identifier may be available, may not be available. Type of primary sample and where relevant, the anatomic site of origin. Primary sample, I have already told you, is a, is a sample collected as such from the patient. As such from the patient. And what the type that you do, it's whole blood, whole urine, or sputum, anything. The anatomic site of origin, what's the meaning of this anatomic site? For example, microbiology, uh, you know, they may send some pus. From where they have taken that pus? So they should know, they should tell us which, which site they have taken and also bone marrow, from where they have taken it. Biopsy, from where they have taken it. FNAC, that is fine needle aspiration, from where they have taken it. So type of primary sample, a very relevant, the anatomic site of origin is very important. Examination is required. What are the tests that are required? <coughs> Clinically relevant information about the patient and the request for examination performance and result interpretation purposes. Note, information needed for examination performance and results interpretation may include the patient's ancestry, family history, travel and exposure history, communicable diseases and other clinically relevant information. Financial information for billing purposes, financial audit, resource management and utilization reviews may also be collected. The patient should be aware of the information collected and the purpose for which it is collected. Any, any, any history can be collected, but only thing is patient should be told why you are collecting that history. Date and where relevant, time of primary sample collection. That I've already told you because this is required for us to establish turnaround on time. If we do not have the time of primary sample collection, we will not be able to establish the turnaround on time. Date and time of sample receipt. This is required. Again, as I've already told you, in case there's a delay in transportation, we would like to know why the delay is happening. So we can always 
you know, sort out these bottlenecks because many a time we have seen samples come and lie in one place, nobody is there to transport them, and there's a delay in transportation. So, in order to, you know, sort out these bottlenecks, it's always better to have date and time of sample receipt. Note, the format of the request form, for example, electronic or paper, and the manner in which requests are to be communicated to the laboratory should be determined in discussion with the users of laboratory services. This is only a should, should is a recommendation. Please note that it is not shall, it is should. Should is a recommendation. Now, what, when, when does this happen? 4.7 advisory services. In that place only, the doctor should be told that we have a request form and also design of the request form should be shown to them and they should approve that because we in the laboratory were existing because of the doctors only. Please note that. The laboratory shall have a documented procedure concerning verbal requests for examinations that includes providing confirmation by request form or electronic equivalent within a given time. What's the meaning of this? Sometimes, you know, doctors will telephone and say, look, I'm sending one patient, please do uh, hemoglobin on him. And then also he will telephone and say, please do creatinine on this patient. That's called as a verbal request. But the standard says, fine, accept it, no problem in that. Only thing is, it has to be confirmed by request. So the doctor should be told, look, we will certainly do the test, certainly do whatever you want to do, we, you want us to do, but please see that you send the request form that the doctor has to sign and then send it. The laboratory shall be willing to cooperate with users or their representatives in clarifying the user's request. Primary sample collection and handling 5.4.4, 5.4.4.1 is general. The laboratory shall have documented procedures for the proper collection and handling of primary samples. Please note that again, we are still in the primary sample collection manual only. The procedures will be in that only. How do you collect sample? Where do we tie the tourniquet? How do we clean the area? How do we use cotton or do we use gauze? With what do we clean the area? Do we do we clean the area from, from center to periphery or periphery to center? Do we use 70% alcohol or do we use rectified spirit? We can't use rectified spirit, it is all banned up. And also cotton, if you see the WHO guidelines, cotton cannot be used, cotton slab cannot be used. We have to use gauze only. So documented procedure will have to include all these proper collection and handling. Where, which, which way we collect the sample? How many minutes we tie, tie the tourniquet? How many minutes we tie the, when do we release the tourniquet? Okay, all that we have to write in this documented procedures for the proper collection and handling of primary samples. And we are still in primary sample collection manual only. The documented procedure should be available to those responsible for primary sample collection, whether or not that collectors are liability staff. As I told you, in hospitals, staff nurses collect, doctors collect, you know, in, in cath lab, uh, uh, cardiologists collect the samples, in ICUs, intensivists collect the samples. Like, there is no problem in that. Only thing is, this procedure should be available to those responsible for primary sample collection, whether or not collectors are liability staff. It is always better to convert this primary sample collection manual into a read-only format, that is a PDF format, and put it in all the systems in the hospital so that everybody can open it and access it and they should not tamper with it because it will be in the read-only format, okay? Otherwise, print version of that can be given. That is, print the primary sample collection manual and then distribute it to everybody, maintain a distribution list because it's a control document. Where the user requires deviations and exclusions from or additions to the documented collection procedure, these shall be recorded and included in all documents containing examination results and shall be communicated to the appropriate person. Please note that. Today, we may be doing in serum, serum, serum creatinine, we will be doing. But uh, serum, you know, clotting of the sample and all that takes time. So, a doctor may want it urgently. In that case, he may say, please collect it in lithium heparin and do it in plasma. Fine, we can do that. Only thing is, that's a deviation. Our regular procedure is collection of clotted blood cells. Now there is a deviation. What's the deviation? We are collecting in lithium heparin. That means we are collecting plasma. So where the user requires deviations and exclusions from or additions to the documented collection procedure, these shall be recorded and included in all documents containing examination results and shall be communicated to the appropriate person. Sometimes, you know, when we do it in serum and plasma, there is a slight difference in the biological reference intervals. Hence, that should be told. Note one. All procedures carried out on patient need informed consent of the patient. Informed consent is you are informing the patient, patient is agreeable for that. Patient is agreeable for that. That is a means of informed consent. For most routine laboratory procedures, consent can be inferred when the patient presents himself or herself at a laboratory with a request form and willingly submits to the usual collection procedure 
for example, venipuncture. Doctor would have already told the patient, look, this is the test that have to be done. So patient is aware of it. He, he will write the request form and give it to the patient. The moment patient comes to the laboratory with a request form, duly filled in by the doctor and signed by the doctor, there is a concern. That is for routine venipuncture. Whereas for other, for other, you know, more invasive procedures, for example, HIV testing, also FNAC, bone marrow, and also pap smear for all these special concerns is required. Okay. So please note that the request form acts as a currency for routine venipuncture. If you open the standard, I don't know how many of you have the standard with you, please open the standard. Go to 4.4.1. Please open the standard. Go to 4.4.1. Para number two, 4.4.1, para number two, it says each request accepted by the laboratory for examinations shall be considered an agreement, service agreement. So the same thing applies here. That means the request form which the laboratory has received is both a service agreement and a consent. Agreement and consent, both itself. Please note that, make a note of that. Patients in a hospital bed should normally be given the opportunity to refuse. Why this happens is many a time the patients are, you know, woken up in the early morning at four o'clock for a collection of fasting sample or for, for doing a glucose tolerance test all that. Because the staff nurses go off duty at six o'clock and they have to complete all this procedure before six o'clock because six o'clock onwards, handovering takes place. They, they hand over. So what they do is they wake up patients at four o'clock and they collect the sample. At that time, patients get irritated. Totally is unphysiological to collect sample at 4 o'clock. So patients get irritated and say, don't collect my sample, go. So at that time, the laboratory, the staff nurse or the laboratory staff should respect it and inform the doctor that this is what happened. Further action will be taken by the doctor concerned. Special procedures, including more invasive procedures, as of, uh, this I've already told you, that is pap smear, uh, FNAC, biopsy, bone marrow aspiration, and also HIV testing. All these require a uh, special separate concern. We'll need a more detailed explanation and in some cases written concern. In emergency situations, concern might not be possible. Under these circumstances, it is acceptable to carry out necessary procedures provided there in the patient's best interest. Sometimes, you know, neighbors bring the patient to the hospital. Patient is in a semi-comatose condition, road traffic accident, somebody is lying on the road, somebody else brings it. So these are the you know cases where a patient will not be uh, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a position to give any history. The standard says you want to do any tests on him, you must do it in the best interest, not because he is, he is not in a condition to give history. Don't do all the tests that are available in the laboratory and give him a fat bill as soon as he recovers, and then he will go back to coma. That should not happen. Okay. So in emergency situations, consent might not be possible under these circumstances. It is acceptable to carry out necessary procedures provided there in the patient's best interest. Note to adequate privacy during reception and sampling should be available and appropriate to the type of information being requested and primary sample being collected. Generally, we have a screen, so we draw a screen and then collect the sample so that others don't see the collection is going on. Sometimes, you know, it's not possible to provide uh, privacy in large hospitals, a lot of patients will be waiting. So in that case, you know, we have to be realistic in that. It's not, it's not always possible to provide privacy. However, if the patient demands privacy, the laboratory has to be. 5.4.4.2 is instructions for pre-collection activities. Laboratory's instructions for pre-collection activities shall include completion of the request form or electronic request. This is for the doctors. Preparation of the patient, for example, instructions to caregivers, lobotomists, sample collectors, and patients. Type and amount of the primary sample to be collected with descriptions of the primary sample containers and any necessary additives. This is generally given in the, in the form of a table. In the form of a table. This table will have the color of the cat, the color of the cat, test, that is name of the examination, volume, volume of the blood to be collected, and what is the additive present in it? Is it EDD? Is it heparin? Is it uh, citrate? That should be there. And it should also have how many times, how many times the sample has to be inverted? How many times? So type and amount of the primary sample to be collected with descriptions of the primary sample containers and any necessary items. This will be in the form of a table only. Now we have two forms of tables here. One is 
for the adult population. How much blood is collected for adult population? How much blood is collected for pediatric population? That has to be there in this. So your table of this that point number C, type and amount of the primary sample to be collected with the descriptions of the primary sample containers and necessary additives. This has to be in the form of a table. Now here, this table will have how the samples for clinical biochemistry to be collected, how the samples for clinical pathology to be collected, how the samples for hematology to be collected, how the samples for microbiology, how the samples for serology to be collected, how the sample specimen for histopathology to be collected. Everything will be there in this. That's why we are still in the primary sample collection manual. Type and amount of the primary sample to be collected with the descriptions of the primary sample containers and any necessary details. All these details will be there and it will be in the form of a table only. Special timing of collection may need. Sometimes, you know, doctor says you collect at 4 a.m., collect at 8 a.m., collect at 4 p.m., like that. So, special timing has to be used. Clinical information relevant to or affecting sample collection, examination performance, or result multiplication. For example, history of administration of drugs. This is certainly required for microbiology, this culture and sensitivity. And Nowadays, many patients are diabetics. If you are doing postprandial sugar or if you are doing fasting sugar or if you are doing HbA1c, it is always to better to you know include what are the drugs the patient is taking. Instructions for collection activities. We have finished with pre-collection. Now we are in collection activities. The laboratory's instructions for collection activities shall include the following. Determination of the identity of the patient from whom a primary sample is collected. How do you determine? Ask the patient to state the name. Ask the patient to state the name or the person who is accompanying the patient can state the name if the patient is unable to speak. Not ask, are you so and so? Because he may not have heard what you said. In, in that case, he may just nod his head. So it is always better to ask the patient to state the name. And also, if the barcode is printed, show that barcode to him. He will identify the name. He will identify the name. So always better to have two ways of identifying the patient. That is determination of the identification from whom his primary sample is collected. Verification that the patient meets pre-examination requirements. For example, passing status, medication status, time of last dose, cessation, sample collection at predetermined time or time intervals. Instructions for collection of primary blood and non-blood samples with the descriptions of the primary sample containers and any necessary additives. How should the samples be collected? So instructions have to be there. This I have already told you about the patient collected samples, just like that. In situations where the primary sample is collected as part of clinical practice, information and instructions regarding primary sample containers, any necessary additives, and any necessary processing and sample transport conditions shall be determined and communicated to the appropriate clinical staff. Now, sometimes they'll be doing drug trials and all that. They would have got a new drug they want to do, they want to see how it is working. Fine, there's no problem in that. Only thing is, uh, the doctor should be told how the sample is collected. Instead of labeling of primary samples in a manner that provides an unequivocal link with the patients from whom they are collected. Instructions of labeling. There are two ways of labeling. One is, you know, you label the uh, sample and then collect it. That is the best way to do. Or collect the sample and label it. Collecting the sample and labeling it may result in, you know, mislabeling. So it is always better to label the sample and then collect the sample. And uh, generally what happens in ward sales, you know, some the nurse staff nurse will collect samples in, in in the different wards, and come back to the nursing station and try to uh, try to you know remember the names and then try to label it there in the nursing station. That is when the mistakes occur. So instruction should be given to the staff nurses also to see that the samples are collected after the label is stuck there, and the patient should know that it is his sample. A recording of the very to the person collecting the primary sample and the collection date, and when needed, recording of the collection time. This, if you are using computer, or, or automatically the name will come in the computer. When, they, when you print the barcode, it will come there. It will be However, if the laboratory is not doing a computer, if you are not printing a barcode, somebody has to enter in the register. Instructions for proper storage conditions before collected samples are delivered to the laboratory. Sometimes, you know, what they do is they collect 10 samples and then transport to the laboratory. So, during that period, when 10 samples are stored before transportation, they should know how to store it, where to store it, so that the samples do not get deteriorated. Safe disposal of materials used in the collection. What are the materials we dispose after collection? We dispose gloves, probably. We dispose the needle. And if you are using evacuated tubes, we don't dis 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 discard the tube there. We may discard the syringe if you are using syringe for collection. Okay, And also gauze you may dispose. 
So safe disposal of materials using the collection, we have to follow the local biomedical waste guidelines. 5.4.5 is sample transportation. The laboratory's instructions for post-collection activities shall include packaging of samples for transportation. The laboratory shall have a documented procedure for monitoring the transportation of samples to ensure they are transported within a time frame, generally within half an hour. Now we have, uh, you know, in, in a hospital we have pneumatic chutes. So these pneumatic chutes do not take more than one minute. So time frame will be not more than one minute in a hospital which practices pneumatic chutes. However, for microbiology, see, you know, your uh, culture tubes and uh, any other material, throat swabs and all that, they can't be transported by pneumatic chute. They should be transported only by manual. So one person will carry everything. And as I, as I told you, time frame cannot be more than half an hour and they should be able to transport it. And clear cut instructions have to be given for the person who transports the sample. Within a temperature interval specified for sample collection and handling and with the designated preservatives to ensure the integrity of samples. Here in most of the places, the temperature may not exceed 35 degrees Celsius, but in some places where it exceeds 40 degrees Celsius, maybe ice pack is required. So temperature interval has to be provided depending upon the temperature of the area, region. In a manner that ensures the integrity of the sample and the safety for the carrier, the general public and the receiving laboratory in compliance with established requirements. Please note that I've already told you all the samples should be in an upright position. All the samples will be upright. They'll be kept in a rack. The rack will be kept in a box. That box will have a lid. It will have a handle and it will also have a biohazard sticker. Biohazard sticker. Only then the person who carries it will wear gloves. They'll also wear a mask and then carry. Look at that. In a manner that ensures the integrity of the sample and the safety of, for the carrier. All these things are required the general public and the receiving laboratory in compliance with established requirements. Because, you know, many a time we, from wards they bring samples, throat swab is brought from the sample. So in that case, the public should know that, they, you know, there is a biological material in there. Hence, that bio, that bio has a sticker has to be there. Because public will be walking here. Note, a laboratory which is not involved in primary sample collection and transportation is considered to have satisfied clause 5.4.5c above. When, upon receipt of a sample, whose integrity was compromised or which could have jeopardized the safety of the carrier or the general public, the sender is contacted immediately and informed about measures to be taken to eliminate records. That is, you know, in case the samples are rejected because of some problem, uh, that person who sent the sample should be informed about it. Uh, this is applicable to collection centers. 5.4.6 is sample reception. The laboratory's procedure for sample reception shall ensure that the following conditions are met. We are still in primary sample collection manual only. We have not left it. As I told you, 5.4, the full clause will be in the primary sample collection manual. Samples are unequivocally traceable by request and labeling to an identified patient or site. Laboratory developed and documented criteria for acceptance or rejection of samples are applied. I've already told you, we, we reject underfilled samples, overfilled samples, clotted samples. We reject unlabeled samples. We reject samples that are wrongly labeled. So we have to apply the acceptance and rejection criteria here. Where there are problems with patient or sample identification, the sample instability due to delay in transport or inappropriate containers, insufficient sample volume, or when the sample is clinically critical or irreplaceable, and the laboratory chooses to process the sample, the final report shall indicate the nature of the problem and where applicable, that caution is required when interpreting the result. Many a time from ICUs, we don't get enough, you know, vein would have collapsed. So in that case, the staff nurse says, sir, we can't collect samples from this person, only little I've got. So fine, accept it. And what do you do at that time? Our technicians are very smart. What they do is they separate the serum, and if the sample is insufficient, they may even dilute with saline and do the test. Or sometimes they, they use one prop up, you know, they prop up that. In the sample cup, they keep the sample so that the probe can reach the sample. They do all kinds of things. Absolutely, there's no problem in that. Only thing is that they, in the final report, we should indicate what problems we have faced. Uh, if you take uh, CSF, that is serum gross spinal fluid, many a time, you know, when they do a, when they do this uh, from a tap, uh, that time the amount may be very less in that. Even in that case, what they do is they dilute the sample in saline and make correction for the dilution and then report it. But they should include that in the report, saying that this was done in a diluted sample. So all these apply here, that point C, where there are problems with patient or sample identification, sample in instability due to delay in transport or inappropriate containers, 
insufficient sample volume or when the sample is clinically critical or irreplaceable and the laboratory chooses to process the sample, the final report shall indicate the nature of the problem and where applicable, that caution is required when interpreting the result. All samples received are recorded in an accession book, worksheet, computer, or other comparable system. There is a separate accession area. There will be a computer. If, if the laboratory is having a barcode, they will scan it there immediately that is recorded. Otherwise, they, might, they have to use a register and that register, they have to write all the names of the patients, write the MRI number, write the time of sample receipt. So, this is sample reception. That means it can be either in an accession book, worksheet, computer or other comparable system. The date and time of receipt and or registration of samples shall be recorded. Whenever possible, the identity of the person receiving the sample shall also be recorded. This will be there, you know, generally in a row, duty roster, it will be there in that. We know who has exactly accepted the sample. Authorized personnel shall evaluate received samples to ensure that they meet the acceptance criteria relevant for the requested exams. Here, I don't know how many of you have visited the uh, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. They have a beautiful system there. There are three people all the time standing there. All the samples that come there, whether by pneumatic tube or manually brought there, they look at all the samples, they look at the label, they look at the volume, they look at everything there. If the sample is leaking, everything. There. If there is any doubt, they keep them aside. And then call the staff nurse to come and identify that. They have a beautiful system there. If, if, if you visit Kochi, next time kindly visit that Amrita Institute of Medical because there are some very good practices there. So, authorized personnel shall evaluate received samples to ensure that they meet the acceptance criteria relevant for the requested examinations. Where relevant, there shall be instructions for the receipt, labeling, processing, and reporting of samples specifically marked as urgent. Here, what we do is we have a red sticker. We put that red sticker on that sample, and the same red sticker is also put on the request form so that it is transported immediately to the examination area and they process it in a stack mode. It's called a stack mode. The instructions shall include details of any special labeling of the request form and sample, the mechanism of transfer of the sample to the examination area of the laboratory, any rapid processing mode to be used, and any special reporting criteria to be followed. All portions of the primary sample shall be unequivocally traceable to the original primary sample. In case you know they take out some amount of the primary sample, they should be very careful, they should label it properly so that they know from which tube they have taken. Last subclass of this 5.4 is the most important 5.4.7 pre examination handling, preparation, and storage. Here we have not yet come to 5.5. 5.5 is examination processes. We are still in the pre examination process only. Now, in this area, what are the things that take place? Separation of serum takes place here. Separation of serum, separation of plasma, separation of urinary sediment takes place here. RNA extraction also takes place here. RNA extraction, if you are doing RT PCR, RNA extraction will take place. Okay, in addition to that, any smears you all prepare, that will also take place here. So, pre examination, handling, preparation, storage is most important. Okay, so as I've been telling you, centrifugation of primary samples will take place here. We have to, we have to display the procedure for centrifugation of primary samples. Centrifuge should be here in this area. Okay, how do you separate this urinary sediment? There should be a procedure for that. So, how do you extract RNA before you pass it on to that pass box for, you know, the, what is that? Where you, you do that RNA uh, testing. Okay, so laboratory shall have procedures and appropriate facilities for securing patient samples and avoiding deterioration, loss or damage during pre examination activities and during handling, preparation, storage. Uh, now, you may separate the serum and you may separate the plasma. You may not do it immediately. You may you may do it in the afternoon, but until then, storage has to be done properly. So the laboratory should provide proper storage space for these things. Let us say, for example, HbA1c. HbA1c we do it in batches only. So what we do, we collect all the samples till about uh, one o'clock or two o'clock, and afternoon three o'clock we process all the samples. So until then, there should be proper storage. Laboratory procedures shall include time limits for requesting additional examinations or further examinations on the same primary sample. Morning, we have received a sample for creatinine. Afternoon, 2 o'clock, the doctor calls and says, can you do electrolytes on that? We say, no, we can't do that because the time limit is there. Whereas, reverse can be done. If they, have, if they sent a sample for electrolytes in the morning at 8 o'clock and they say in the afternoon, can you do creatinine? Yes, we can do that because creatinine doesn't have, nothing happens to that on story. So, this way, the whole laboratory, whatever examination the laboratory is doing, we should include the time limits for requesting additional examinations or further examinations of the same primary sample. This is mandatory and this should be available in the laboratory and also in the primary sample collection. 
Okay. So that completes our decoding of the standard 5.4 pre examination process. Please note that it is present in the It is present in the primary sample collection manual. That is a level two document. It's a level two document. Okay. Now I have to stop sharing. Can you, can you, can you, can you, can you. Dr. Venkatesh has joined. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Venkatesh has joined. Okay. Shall I stop sharing or is he going to take? Sir, is, uh, you can continue to sharing, sir. No problem. Please. I, you're, you're a better person to do that, I think. <laughs> okay. No problem. I'll do that. How to stop sharing? Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can sir. you hear me? I'll stop sharing, sir. Yes, can sir. You can hear me, you. please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. We are able to hear you. Ashutosh, can you hear me? Three, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are able to hear you. Three times you have to tell, no? Because it's like a court. Hello? Can yes, you hear me? Yes, yes. Three times. Ashutosh, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Your call has been muted. Ventage, we can hear you. Dr. Pankatesh, come in your We can hear you. Can you hear me? Doctor. Yes, sir. Are you able to hear me, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are able to hear you. One second. I am not able to hear you. Uh, let me log in again. One second. Yes, what are you doing? Let me log in again. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, sir. Uh, you are able to hear me, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you can project. You can project. Where is he? Has he left? Where is Vintage? Up on sir. Sir, uh, we are wait waiting for Mr. Venkatesh. No, he was here just now. Where is he? He left up. Sir. Yeah, Venkatesh, sir, Dr. Venkatesh is here, sir. He is here. Where? Ah, you can start, no? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, yeah, yeah. Dr. Sir, we are not able to hear you. Dr. Venkatesh, he's, we are he's not muted. able to hear you. He's muted. Yeah, you're muted, sir. Hear me now? Ah, we can hear you. Ah, easy. From here. One, two, three. 
you are able to hear me now you know yes sir hello yes sir yes sir we are able to hear you can you hear yes sir am i audible yes sir you are able to see me yes sir okay uh, thank you very much uh, there was some technical problem on my side i, I apologize for that now after the pre examination processes all of you have seen there are several processes together in the pre examination all of you who are working in accredited testing laboratory or going in for accreditation should also know that there are two more processes one is pre examination processes now we are going to examination processes can you make it full screen please for examination processes 5.5 whomsoever is projecting i request you to make it full screen okay can you change the slide please i request you to change the slide you are hearing me hello am i audible am i audible to you i can see okay ashutosh i'm not able to see the slide uh yes, i'm not I'm, able to see i'm i'm doing it again sir okay 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 is my voice clear to you yes sir yes sir okay yeah. okay no everything is very clear uh, i'm not able to see the slide just to project the slide i'm doing it sir i can see the 5.5 examination processes kindly move on to the next slide okay here this is we are talking about the selection of the methodology verification of the methodology why i am very particular about this terminology is laboratory shall use only verified method validated method and they will verify therefore they will select validated method and they will verify that's what title says of examination procedures we don't say testing examination procedure please make a note testing is in 17025 in 15189 we never use the word testing it is examination like doctors examine patients you laboratory people will examine the patient's representative that is the sample let us look at the 5.5.1 all the time you know last decimal place point 1 is general it may require documented procedure the laboratory that is the test the examining laboratory shall select examination procedure which have been validated for their intended use there are two words here one is validated and this intended use i will just briefly explain to you you see when you are doing creatinine when you are doing glucose you are using some kit method that kit insert will be there that kit insert gives all the details of performance qualification their kit insert is says we are we are already validated by the supplier of the kit or the manufacturer of the kit and there is no need for the laboratory to revalidate they have to only verify what the manufacturer claims is correct for example when you buy car they say it gives 20 km per liter that means the manufacturer of the car benz or honda they would have validated but you have to verify by putting 1 liter of petrol you know verification is the responsibility of the user for what that have been validated for intended use they have validated that kit for glucose estimation in blood but you cannot use it for glucose estimation in urine that is not intended use that's how it should be understood the identity of the person performing the examination activities in examination processes shall be recorded who did what and when at what time this is very very important therefore documentation and of this is very important the specified requirement 
there are specified requirements. What are the specified requirements? They are called performance specification. This performance specification is not very easy to understand. When you, uh, later on, I will explain to you in brief, the performance specification or specified requirement for that particular intended use of the method for each examination procedure shall relate to the intended use of that exam, not for unintended use. Note says, note is not part, it's only explanatory note. The preferred procedures are those specified in the instruction for use of in vitro medical devices or those that have been published in established authoritative textbooks that we consider as validated, peer reviewed texts and journals that is validated, or international consensus standard or guidelines. That means some experts in international committee will meet. They say, yes, this stain is good. This method is good. That can be accepted. Or national or regional regulations. Now, the national regional of NPL, NCL, they would have come out with certain regulations and recommendations that can be accepted. Can you change it to the next slide, please? Change it, please. Slide change, please. OK. Let us see verification of examples here. We are not going to talk about validation because validation is not our responsibility, lab responsibility. Verification of exam procedure. Now, validated examination procedure used without modification. Like you buy the car, they say it gives one liter for one liter 20 kilometer, but you change the carburetor, change the uh, something in the car and you cannot claim from that company it is not giving 20 kilometer. Similarly, the validated examination procedure what is what you got used without modification shall be subject to independent verification by the laboratory before being introduced into routine use. That means even before the patient sample is run, you have to run something called control. When you run control, control will have a value and a range. Your examination procedure, that instrument for that particular sample should give result which is that very close to that control value, that plus or minus deviation. The laboratory shall obtain information from the manufacturer, method developer for confirming the performance characteristics of the procedure. For every procedure, the performance characteristics will be available at the manufacturer or method developer and laboratory should procure it. That information shall obtain information from manufacturer. It should be available. So laboratory is not going to validate the validation results, validation values must be available with the laboratory which laboratory should try to get it from the manufacturer or method developer. The independent verification by the laboratory shall confirm through obtaining objective evidence in the form of performance characteristic. I will explain to you what are all the performance characteristics, linearity, specificity, sensitivity, bias, measurement uncertainty, measurement trueness, so many things are involved in that. That the performance claims for the exam procedure have been met. Change, go to the next one, please. Change this slide, okay. Now coming to this verification continuation, the performance claims for the examination procedure confirmed during the verification process shall be those relevant to the intended use of the exam results. It is a performance characteristics. It is called a performance qualification PQ of all the test methods should be available. Instruments also be, you know, installation qualification, design qualification, performance qualification, and operational qualification. Now the laboratory shall document the procedure used for the verification and record the results obtained. What about laboratory? Uh, do they have the uh, you know uh, data for validation that they have to get it from the manufacturers of the reagents and kits? Staff with appropriate authority means lab laboratory director would have authorized. Okay, Ashutosh, you are working in my laboratory. We have authorized you to review the verification results and record the review. Ashutosh will review and record it and put the signature. You know, only authorized and competent person in the laboratory will have to review and verify results and record the review and record it. That should be available at any time to assessors like you or me or uh, Sandeep. We have to, when we come as assessors, this should be available to assessors. Go to the next slide, please. Next, okay. The laboratory, now coming to validation of exam procedure. I told you right from the beginning, validation is not the responsibility of the examining laboratory. But still, why are we having this validation of exam procedure? Because invariably, the laboratory will uh, use non-standard method. 
what is that non-standard method, which is not published anywhere. But method is good. They are using it, giving good results, but it's not method published. Our laboratory may be designing, developing their own method. That also happens. Most of the laboratories have become research laboratories. They do research, they develop, but they are not published. Or they are using standard method, which is valid, already validated, but outside the intended scope. <coughs> I told you, we have Boromo Kesal Green for all women estimation in the serum or plasma. What is happening? Somebody wants to estimate albumin in urine. They say, okay, anyway, reagent is there, let us use. But it is not within the scope. It is outside the intended scope. That need to be validated. Finally, we normally 99% laboratories are using validated method. But they are slightly modified. Laboratory always do that to reduce the cost. They reduce the volume. They ch change the methodology, you know, uh, in, say incubation, temperature incubation, or centrifuging. Therefore, validated method subsequently modified. Under these four classes, our standard says, non-standard method, laboratory designed or developed method, standard method outside their intended scope, or validated method subsequently modified, need to be revalidated. Validation has to be done. The validation shall be as extensive as is necessary and conform through the provision of objective evidence means all the data should be there in the form of performance characteristic. I told you linearity, specificity, sensitivity, bias, answer, you know, interfering substances, things like that. That specific requirements for an intended use of the examination have been fulfilled. Therefore, please, all of you laboratory people, remember, don't use any of the above four. Use only validated method, don't change that. Now, somewhere, someday something happens, then this uh, performance characteristics for that has to be produced. Go to the next one, please. Change this slide, okay. Coming to validation of exam procedure, there's a note, performance characteristics. I would like to read this for you. The performance characteristics of an examination procedure during the validation should include, it is not shall include, should this again, <laughs> opportunities given depending upon the method, any of them or all of them, many of them, combination or all of them, consideration should be considered. Now what is number one? Measurement trueness. Most of us do not know what is measurement trueness. Calibration laboratories and the other testing laboratory under 17025, they know what is measurement trueness. Under 17043, for um, PT provider, they know what is measurement trueness. Even for 17034, for RMP, they know what is measurement trueness. But generally, our medical laboratories, we don't bother about measurement trueness, you know. Measurement accuracy, that also we don't do. Measurement precision, including intermediate precision when the operator changes, when the instrument changes, when they up to the service, before service, all these things, you know. Uh, for last six months, so many changes will happen. Controls will change, calibrators might change, maintenance might change, intermediate precision also should be considered, including measurement, repeatability and measurement, intermediate precision, I told you, measurement uncertainty. Uncertainty is, uh, there are five factors which results in uncertainty. What are these five factors? I can put it in a very simple term, swipe, S-W-I-P-E. Remember swipe, you swipe your uh, credit card on the machine. You uh, pendulum swipes from left to right. That swipe of the pendulum in the clock should be as narrow as possible. Not uh, from that end to this end of the room. Swipe should be as small as possible. What is swipe? It is the uncertainty. That means when you are measuring glucose, it should be 100. But it is giving you 99.5 or 100.2. Okay, that uncertainty factor is always there because of five factors. What are these five factors? One is standard. The standard used in laboratory A is very high quality standard. Therefore, they have very small uncertainty. The laboratory B uses uh, poor quality standard. They have very high uncertainty. That pendulum swings from that end to this end. That is one is the standard. Now, W, next, of the swipe. W. W is a work procedure. The work procedure is validated in lab A. That's why uncertainty is small. Uncertainty, the work procedure is not validated in lab B. Uncertainty is high. Therefore, validation is a very important thing to minimize uncertainty. Then I. The I here is instrument. When you talk about instrument to measure, 
that instrument may be calibrated or, or calibrated and well maintained in lab A, but the instrument is not calibrated in lab B. That's why in lab B, the swipe is long, uh, large. In lab A, since because it's called calibrated, uncertainty factor is very, very small. Then comes P. Yes, W, I, P. That P is personal. You are like you and me. These people should be trained, you know. Training should be, certificate should be there. You saw under 5.1.5. That training certificate should be there. That training should be given by appropriate person in the area required. If in lab A, everybody is trained very well, therefore uncertainty is very low. In lab B, nobody is trained. Therefore, each one is doing in their own way. Therefore, there's another factor which uh, results in uncertainty. Finally, E. E is environmental condition. Lab A has maintained excellent environmental condition, whereas Lab B has no control on environment. Therefore, environmental monitoring, as Dr. Busha was mentioned, or Anand was mentioning, you know, uh, accommodation and environmental condition in under 5.2, you saw, if all these things are properly maintained, controlled, then the uncertainty, a deviation be very, very small. Therefore, swipe is the uncertainty, and measurement uncertainty is also required for validation of exam procedure. And analytical sensitivity. Analytical specificity, including interfering substances, analytical sensitivity, detection limit, that some things will detect only from A to B, B or not B, and, uh, B or B below A, and uh, quantitation limit, measurement intervals, diagnostic specificity, diagnostic sensitivity, look, so many factors, there are 11 of them which are required to validate the examination procedure. It is not possible by you and me in our routine laboratory where we get 100 samples, 100 patients per day with 300 tests. How can we do that? Therefore, my strong recommendation as per the requirement of this standard, please do not use non-validated exam procedure. Use only validated exam procedure for if we are going in for accreditation. The laboratory that is examining laboratory shall document the procedure used for the validation. That is a lot of work, I tell you. And record the results obtained, review that. Staff with authority shall review the validation. That staff should be special PhD in that uh, exam, you know, procedures and uh, validation results and record the review. When changes are made to validated examination procedure, in case changes are made, the influence of such change shall be documented and when appropriate, new validation shall be carried out. This, look at this. This is very tough. I, I recommend 5.5.1.3 should not be, you know, uh, looked into. Understand, but don't try to validate any examination procedure. This is my golden uh, rule to all of the law to all of you. Use only validated exam procedure. Then you will not have any problem in your laboratory when assessment goes on. Go to the next slide, please. <coughs> Measurement uncertainty of measured quantity value. Now, how do we do this? We have to calculate uncertainty. We have to calculate CV percentage. Two times CV, they say it's uncertainty. It's not exactly two by two times CV. It's 1.98 multiplied by uh, the CV becomes uncertainty. Only the examination phase. Remember, it doesn't cover pre-examination 5.4, post-examination 5.7. It's only the examination phase. Now, the examining laboratory, pathology laboratory, or microbiology laboratory, or biochemistry laboratory, serology laboratory, micro, uh, molecular diagnosis laboratory, shall determine measurement uncertainty for each measurement procedure in the examination phase. See, we have to underline in the examination phase means when the sample is loaded on the machine till the results are obtained only in that phase, which is used to report measured quantity value on patient sample. Measurement uncertainty has to be done in the examination phase even before the patient sample is run. The laboratory shall define the performance requirements for the measurement uncertainty for each measurement procedure, regularly review estimates of measurement uncertainty. Now, I will replace this measurement uncertainty for a minute by CV. We calculate CV. How do we calculate? Every day we plot uh, control value. We have one level, two level, or three level, three level in hematology, two level in biochemistry, okay. We run controls. Some laboratories use controls on alternatives. One level one control today, level two control tomorrow. That is not acceptable. Because we get uh, level one control is for uh, uh, biologically normal population, uh, you know. Uh, level two may be a pathological population. But we don't know on which day which sample comes to us. Remember, the measure, even before the patient sample is run, there should be plan. The plan for 
quality control, quality assurance. There should be a plan. It should be defined, designed by the laboratory. Therefore, as soon as the technology enters the lab, which is which was on the machine after checking calibration, they run control. They look at the control value. That control value should fall within that range, x plus or minus y. That if it falls within that range, that day uh, they plot it and see whether it's within 1 SD, 2 SD, or 3 SD. If it is uh, 10 times 1 SD, we, we apply best guard rules, or uh, 2 2 S, 1 3 S, then uh, there are certain rules which one has to follow. This is what it talks about. The measurement uncertainty or the CV percentage uh, has to be calcul calculated daily on daily basis, checked checked with the uh, last one week, 10 days value, and then only take decision whether the uh, test examination procedure can continue on patient sample or not. Next, please. Let us go to 5.1.5. Please change the slide. There are three notes here. Note is only explanatory note. The relevant uncertainty component are those associated with actual measurement process. Only a measurement process, not in the pre-exam and the post, commencing with the presentation of the sample to the measurement procedure, that is in the examination hall, testing area, and ending with the output of the measured value. Now it is very clear for all of us, measurement uncertainty is limited to, after receiving sample, we load the sample on the machine till the result, printout comes out only within that range. Now, note 2 says measurement uncertainty may be calculated using quantitative values obtained by the measurement of quality control material, QC material. In some countries, it's called quality control. Some places, it's called internal quality control. Material under intermediate precision. That means the quality control is used, can be kept for one or two years. It is used every day. And uh, after 15 days, instrument undergoes maintenance. Some operator changes, maybe kit changes. These are all uh, intermediary changes. Intermediate precision has to be considered. That include, look at it, as many routine changes as reasonably possible. What are they? Operation of a measurement procedure, example, change of reagent and calibrator batches. Different operators on different days. Scheduled instrument maintenance one of these days. All will be looked into for intermediate precision. Note 3 says, examples of a practical utility of measurement uncertainty estimate might include confirmation that patient's value meet quality goals. Quality, that means the it should uh, come to the expectation. Uh, it cannot be deviated. It, if it is uh, too much of deviation may result in uh, risk to the patient. That means meaningful comparison of patient value with the previous value of the same type or with clinical decision value or biological reference interval. Go to the next slide, please. The laboratory shall consider measurement uncertainty when report interpreting measured quantity value. What, what it says is, it need not be put on the report forum. It should be looked into while interpreting measured quantity value. Upon request only, if clinician requests, the laboratory shall make its estimates of measurement uncertainty available to laboratory users provided they understand. If they do not understand, there is no meaning in giving this. Suppose laboratory gives, un we are uncertain by this percent, that percent. The user may think the laboratory itself is uncertain, they may stop sending sample. Now, where examination include a measurement step, but do not report measured quantity value. The laboratory should uh, calculate the uncertainty of the measurement step when it has utility in assessing the reliability of the exam procedure or has influence on the reported result. Data should be maintained by the laboratory. Therefore, what we saw so far in the examination processes, we have to look at the use of only validated methods. We should not try to modify the validated method. Then we should also look at the measurement uncertainty. Next, go to the next one now. Five point, can you change please? 5.5.2 5 talks about biological referral intervals or clinical decision value. 
you know earlier we used to say standard value uh, you know standard uh, you know value in general population but there is nothing like standard we have population from different racial background etc the biological reference interval uh, the laboratory shall define the biological reference interval or clinical decision value laboratory is not generating this document the basis for this reference interval or decision value and communicate this to inform uh, this information to users why they should know that if it is beyond this or below this biological reference interval then they have to uh, take that with uh, caution in order to uh, treat the patient when a particular biological referral interval inter biological reference interval or decision value is no longer relevant for the population sir appropriate changes will be made and communicated to the user it happens over a period of time you know that cholesterol story uh, what is acceptable what is not acceptable now the whole thing has changed even glucose american diabetic association has changed the entire you know uh, earlier uh, whatever they said is acceptable now uh, it will totally change then that's why when a particular biological reference interval or decision value is no longer relevant for the population sir appropriate change shall be made communicated to the user because report form will carry this finally when the laboratory changes an examination procedure or pre-examination procedure the laboratory shall review associated reference meet intervals and clinical decision values as applicable next please go to the next one change please okay coming to the last part documentation of examination procedure you know i would like to tell you here documentation of the exam procedure is very very important in order to maintain uniformity in the examination by whomsoever is working in the laboratory if examination procedure is not there then each one will be, use their own way of doing things and there will be a lot of deviation uncertainty from person to person will be very high the examination procedure shall be documented when i come as an assessor to your laboratory first thing i'll ask you under 5.5.3 .5 can i have a list of procedures you are exam you are using as examination procedure if you go to 17.025 they don't say examination for they say test procedure then in uh, our calibration procedure in medical diagnostic laboratory medical test medical examining laboratory it is the examination procedure uh, that should be documented okay they have 25 different methods have they documented they shall be written in a language commonly understood by the staff in the laboratory means i went to tamil nadu that uh, some people did not know anything other than Tamil. If exam procedure was written in Tamil, you know, in the local language, it's a good way. Highly appreciate by the staff in the and be available in appropriate locations. What is that appropriate location? Where that exam is carried out? Is that procedure available there? Any condensed document. Sometimes you know, kit inserts. Now condensed document step one, step two, step four, step five, ten test steps will be there. Condensed document document format, a card file, or similarly used system shall correspond to the documented procedure. It should be a cross reference from where it was also, from where it is extracted from. Therefore, they may have a card file. It should refer to their kit insert. That should have a reference from where that kit insert has collected the information. There should be traceability of this information obtained, unbroken chain of traceability to the validated procedure, published method, or things like that. Next one, please change. Coming to this uh, note, working instruction, note down in a piece of a card file, similar system that summarize key information are acceptable for use as quick reference at the workbench, provided that the full document, doc, full documented, fully documented procedure is available for reference. Note 2 says information from product instruction for use that is kit and set may be incorporated into examination procedure by reference. What happens? I went to a laboratory, they had kit insert for one of the method, one of the estimations. When I saw the kit insert, they had written the date received on 10, 12, 19, uh, uh, 98. Yeah, but we are in 2022, they have not even changed it. Every time new kit comes, that kit insert should be replaced by the new kit insert because every kit comes with the kit insert. Now, they told me, sir, there is no change for last 10 years. It doesn't matter. There's a change in the kit. 
They may not be changing the kit inside. That kit is old, this kit is new. You must replace it. All documents that are associated with the performance of examination, including procedure, summary documentation, condensed document format, product instruction for you, shall be subjected to document control. What is that? Obsolete, should not be available at the place of work. That's what I'm telling you. 2013 kit insert shall not be available in 2023. Please remember. Next, please. Go to the next one. Coming to the, in addition to document control identifier, header, footer, page number, page one of five, two of five, then who issued, who authorized, everything will be there. In addition to this document control identifier, documentation shall include when applicable to the examination procedure, the following, all these things shall be there in the examination procedure. What are purpose of the examination? Why do we do this exam? Number two, principle and method of the procedure used for examination. That also should be there. Then performance characteristics that is obtained from the manufacturer 5.5.1.2 and 5.5.1.3. We have already seen performance characteristics. Then the type of sample, whether it's a primary sample, secondary sample, the whole blood, plasma, serum, urine. Patient preparation, like fasting, postprandial, after drug. Now, type of container and additives. The container also, whether it's plastic, glass, or what type of container, what is the additive in that? Next, with a vacuum tube, what is the additive? Is a non-vacuum tube, what is the additive? Different color-coded caps will tell us for what. Next, please. Change this. Required equipment and reagent. For that particular examination procedure, what equipment is required? What reagents are required? If equipment is required, what is the equipment number? Is that equipment calibrated? Is that equipment maintained? When was the equipment last service? All that information will be looked into. And environmental and safety con controls. Now, uh, what is the environmental condition required for that particular examination? What are the safety control? There may be, eye, uh, you know, the uh, glasses may be required. Maybe face mask may be required. Maybe in this COVID situation, in this pandemic, the safety control, safety precaution measures should be there. Calibration procedure. Sometimes some toxic material, radioactive materials. How do we handle that concept of safety control? Calibration procedure. That calibration procedure, meteorological traceability, tomorrow you are going to hear from our Ashutosh that um, whatever you measure, that measuring instrument should have unbroken chain of traceability to the manufacturer of the reference material or controls, which is traceable to uh, the National Meteorological Institute or, uh, in India, National you know, Physical Laboratory. That should be traceable to BIPM through regional uh, uh, reference laboratories to BIPM. That BIPM, which is under the CIPM, BIPM will have a uh, traceability to standards kept at NIST National Institute of Standards and uh, traceable, you know, in USA Bethesda. Now, procedural steps. What are the various procedures? Step one, step two, step three, step four. Then quality control procedure before running the sample. How the quality control materials obtained, how it is reconstituted, how it is stored, how it is stored, how it is loaded, how the value is obtained, how the value is analyzed. Then interferences, sometimes lipemia, lipemic sample, <laughs> thermalized sample interferes with potassium, bilirubinemia, drugs. There are so many things, you know, the unlike in other testing laboratory, in food testing and medical testing, there are a lot of matrix requirements. There are so many matrix, uh, uh, matrix are in, you know in, uh, involved in that. That's why matrix, uh, uh, you know, compatible human matrix compatible controls are used, and uh, principle of procedure for calculating results, including where relevant, the measurement uncertainty of measured quantity value. Please go to the next one. Biological reference interval and clinical decision value in normally taken from textbooks and journals are, have to be there available in the examination procedure. The, exam, the examination procedure should also have reportable intervals of exam results so that the person who is reporting will not report something which should not be reported. Instructions for determining quantitative results when a result is not within the measurement interval. Alert critical value where appropriate. Laboratory clinical interpretation, 
for which clean, uh, the, some more details are required from the clinician. Potential sources of variation. You know, I tell you this R, laboratory clinical inf interpretation. I have seen in many laboratories, they receive samples from private practitioners. These private practitioners, they have a scribbling pad. In that pad, they write some medicines. Below that, get blood glucose done, get cholesterol done, lipid profile done. Nothing else. Only patient name is there. Even gender may not be there, age will not be there, date of birth will be there. No, that comes as a test request form. Laboratory has to generate the test request form. That is what Dr. Anand was very specifically mentioning. Test request form should include whatever the standard has mentioned under the information to be obtained. Potential sources of variation. Apart from that, oh, where did this all, where from where all this information came? References should be there. If you look at the kit insert, uh, kit insert forum, data you will find it is printed in font size two or two and a half it will have so many references you need a magnifying glass to see and read okay go to the next one please this if the laboratory intends to change an existing examination procedure that results of their interpretation could be significantly different the interpretation shall become explained to users of the laboratory services after validating the procedure. This is something which has to be highlighted, read again and again, understand. This requirement can be accomplished in different ways, depending upon local circumstances. Read a note. Some methods include direct mailing, laboratory newsletter, or part of the examination report. It's in the examination report itself, it will be mentioned. Therefore, this communication is very important when the laboratory intends to change the existing exam procedure to some other procedure. Please move on, go to the next one. Now, coming to the ensuring quality of examination results. Ashutosh. Sir, sir, my request is now uh, actually that timing was uh, up to 4 o'clock. I know. You kindly continue tomorrow morning. Sure, that's why I called you, Ashutosh. No, I mean. No hurry, after 5.6, all are short, small, small sections within one and a half hours, it will be over. Okay. So, okay. sir, you will get, you will, uh, tell me. So, so, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, can we start? Sure, definitely. And, uh, sir, uh, first of all, I will request you to kindly recap. Complete clause 4, clause 5, sorry, we have completed, and then you will continue from clause 5.6. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, isn't tomorrow. it? Definitely. Yes, we have a recap and then yes, we continue. Well, Thank well, you, very good. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thanks to Professor. my colleagues, Dr. Anand, for taking a uh, big uh, you know, <laughs> portion today, Dr. Busha. I'm very sorry. My system still has some problem. Thanks to Ashutosh for projecting slides for me. And you, have, you. you should be my boss. You, are, you have become my assistant. Thank you, Ashutosh. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Tomorrow, 11 o'clock, sir. Sure, oh. sure. We'll be there. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Anand. Thank you, Professor Ushanan. Thank you very much, sir.